John McEntee here with uh, Fantasy Files, and we're here with Martin Van Duren from Asphyx uh, and a bunch of other notable uh, bands in the past. And um, yeah, just um, really excited to have him here to chat. And instead of uh, a lot of BSing, let's just get right to it. Um, okay, well, I guess, Martin, um, you know, you have a new album coming out, so, or out now, actually, I'm sorry about that, a new album out now, and pretty much everyone already knows about it and probably heard it already, but I guess just tell them whatever they need to know about it, you know, for the people that are either lived under a rock or people that are maybe uh, newer fans that might not know about the band. Oy, 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 that's a tough one. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, especially for people that have never heard of us, but I, I think, <laughs> what can I say, it's a really traditional kind of... Um, uh, Asphyx album, really. I mean, uh, we're a, quite a conservative, old-school death metal band with a lot of doom influences as well. And uh, I think it's um, quite accessible, the album, when it comes to the tracks. So uh, I think they go easy, you know, in, 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 in into your head and, and kind of catchy, if you want to call it like that. Curse me. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah I agree. I agree. I, I, you know, I, I don't know how to... You know how you say that? How do you... How to, um, uh, yeah give that in, 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 in like correct kind of words you know but like catchy is i guess like the point yeah and, it's uh, definitely yeah. a catchy album okay cool cool so you agree with that um and yeah it's um I, i'm really pleased with the sound it's absolutely brutal it'll straight in your face um uh we use a different mixer for a change because uh well we always used like dan swano in the past but Mm -hmm. It's not nothing against Dan because he's a fantastic one, one to, per, to, to work with and he's a good friend of ours. But uh, we just yeah. thought everybody was using him nowadays. And we thought, well, you know, we just want to try something else out. And we're really pleased with it. The sound is really bombastic. Um, I'm chuffed with my voice as well. I'm chuffed with the, uh, with the guitar works and everything of Paul and, and his compositions. Um, uh, yeah, all the contributions of, of the gay guys, you know, like Alvin and Husky. It's just, uh, I'm really pleased. For me personally, Okay, it's silly to say, you know, for like <laughs> any musician that has a last album out, like, it's not my best, you know, you, you, you do that, but for me, yeah, yeah you know, of course, I, everyone. <laughs> I, think it's, I think this is the greatest shit that we ever made, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah people but it's good, though, to feel that way. I think, I think it's important for bands to feel very uh, optimistic and positive about those material they're doing. If you, if you really don't if you feel that it, like, kind of sucks or whatever, why even bother doing it, you know? Yeah, but for me, for us, the, the, the formula is really easy, you know, it's like uh, when we finally have, you know, all the riffs together and then we start arranging things, usually in the studio, most of it is already arranged, but just like the final, you know, put like the dots on the eye, more or less. And uh, so, yeah, then we start jamming and we did it with this with two weekends. And when we all freak out, you know, and bang our heads and go crazy in the studio, go, OK, this is it, you know, because <laughs> yeah. the thing is what, what people sometimes forget, you know, even though with a rage we're still really fans of the genre. So, you know, if we, if we would not like what we were doing, yeah, why the hell, then there's no point in putting it out. You know, it's just, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there, unfortunately, there's too many old school bands, uh, you know, from the late 80s, early 90s, that seem like they put out just tripe albums just for, you know, just because they want a tour or just, I don't know why, but you listen to it, you don't feel that... Um, that inspiration or that like i don't know it just doesn't feel alive and inspired i mean maybe, maybe it is and just doesn't come out but i noticed with a lot of old school bands when they put out new stuff i, I just i listen to it i'm like eh, whatever it's okay you know and i just want to go back and see the old stuff i think yeah i don't think it's the case with you guys but uh, you know there's a few bands that i i feel really put out good good new stuff but a lot of the old bands it seems like they just lost the fire for why they do it in the first place and maybe it's more of a paycheck than anything else and, and that's you know i understand that you know i mean obviously they want to make money off something they worked hard at but it also really sucks when you have um when you're not really inspired to play especially death metal i mean it's really a a strange kind of music i think to um you know do just as a big money grab kind of thing you know yeah but the thing is of course i mean i fully agree with you john really huh? i mean uh, i i have the same exa exactly the same just just like you say you know and i'm and i'm by the way i'm really um it's a big compliment from you to to hear that you like our album you know because you know as, as an old well, school band yeah, well, you know, it's cool. <laughs> you know, because you know, you you know your things. So you know, 
just quickly add to what you just said. Um, don't forget that a lot of these these old school bands, all of a sudden, they get like offers from Europe uh, to play live at some because all these festivals they want to have like something unique, you know, like a band that hasn't played before. Yes. And then all of a sudden, like there come enormous offers to these bands, like thousands and thousands of dollars, and then I think, oh, there's still interest for us, you know. <laughs> so then they do. So then they do a couple of these shows, and the first two or three are cool. But then after it's done, you know, there's no exclusivity anymore and, and all that stuff. And then they try to do a make an album. And like you say, it doesn't have the, uh, yeah, it's, it's apparently then it's for them. It's just all about, oh, well, making some extra bucks. But a lot of these guys are just, you know, after all these years, didn't do anything. And now they've got families, they've got a steady job. They've got a dog in the, in the garden and all that stuff, long yeah. mowing the grass on a Sunday. And all of a sudden, boom, you know, you're on in a festival in, in, in Europe. But it's not how it works. You know, you, you, you know, you really have to, yeah, you have to have that kind of metal heart still in you before, you know, before you go and hit the stage. It's, it's, uh, it's, yeah. it, it's, it has to be in your guts, you know, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm 54 now and people wouldn't, you know, when I was a kid, you know, people told to me, like, oh, well, we'll meet you when you're 30 years old, you know, if you don't <laughs> yeah. listen to that crap. And then I go, okay, let's just make a bet, you know, like hundred euros or four crates of beer, whatever. <laughs> and I and I won that bet, and they paid me, in fact. And I'm and I'm still listening, and I'm still bloody enjoying, uh, you know, new albums that are coming out or the old stuff that I'm listening to, and then especially like being in a band uh, with the guys, you know, with Asphyx, and and still making strong albums. That's essential, and um, I would never, yeah, just like I said before, you know, I would never put out an album if I would not be hundred percent behind it, or even stronger, like hundred and twenty percent. It's just it doesn't doesn't make any sense, you know. What's yeah. the point? That's like that's like going to a job that you don't like. Yeah, especially with the legacy of of the band, there's no reason to um, do an album if it doesn't really mean anything. So I mean, why why even bother? You have enough back catalog that's great that yeah, you know, you don't don't need to write new songs unless they actually mean something either to you or you feel like you can contribute to the band's legacy. You know? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, and, and I, I mean. <clears throat> Yeah, for us, it's, it's you know it's quite clear we, we we've been and and that's I think that's really cool with Asterix, even though on the, there are a bunch of albums I didn't even perform on that was out of the band, but yeah, Asterix really never they never even some albums are really different from one or the other, but they never really made disappointing albums. It's not like where you say no. oh this is a crap album. It's it was just different. I mean, Got Cries is a complete different album from let's say On the Wings of Inferno, but yeah, it's still it's still Asterix, you know, in that that way. Even yeah, though this album is quite some success, but in that way, like the band never sold out. And yeah, you know, for me, the, for me, the worst that can happen is is when a band really kind of you know betrays you. Like you follow them all these years, you support them all these years, and all of a sudden they come with some shit album. And you go, <laughs> this can't bloody be true, you know? Like, yeah, uh, I, I think the, I think the biggest example is is Celtic Frost, Cold Lake. You know? Yeah, yeah, Back for then, sure. Like, bloody <laughs> hell, what's this shit? Yeah, that was a tough one. That was a lot. A lot of bands did that. I, I even with some of the heavy metal bands, I was into like Judas Priest, and I put out Turbo and stuff. Mm -hmm. It just it crushed me at the time, you know. Jesus Christ! <laughs> and, then, you know, and, and then you have like fantastic. I you have like you know like epic things like uh, you know British Steel or uh, you know, Sad Ways of Destiny or Stained Class, and you come with Turbo. How can you do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, I mean, you know, if, if you're going to change that much anyway, in reality, you should just do another band and, and express yourself yeah. that way. And, and then you don't ruin the legacy of the the other band. I never, never really understood that, too. Um, that we're on a topic. A lot of those bands um, kind of in that late 80s, early 90s, especially in Europe, I noticed like a lot of Scandinavian bands and stuff. They put out some really great material early on. And then, you know, like an album or two into it, maybe they put out one really good death metal album, and then they like just totally change their style into something that is not even, uh, you know, barely reminiscent of what they started off being. And it, it, and I understand that people want to change and do other things, and, that, you know, I get it. But at the same time, it does kind of bother me because, you know, I think that they should just say okay we're starting a new band with a new style this is what we want to do and just keep keep the um you know each band separated into you know whatever mindset they're into and then when, if they ever want to go back to doing death metal they can go back to their death metal band if they want to do some weird gothic -y thing or something like that and do that with you know your new gothic band you don't need to do it with you know the 
the classic uh, death metal band that you were in or, or whatnot. I don't know if you if you noticed it or that stuff bothers you, but it kind of bothered me a lot because I was kind of disappointed with the way a lot of bands that I really like kind of um, you know went in crazy directions like that. Yeah, well, you, you read my thoughts. <laughs> you know, there's, not, there's not much to add. I mean, <laughs> really? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, mean and, and I, think, I think one of the best examples, and I have no idea where the hell that came from. Like, all of a sudden, there was this, um, I don't know exactly which period it was, but all of a sudden, it seemed that all these bands were making covers of Depeche Mode. <laughs> yeah. Like, how fucking horrible is Depeche Mode? If I, if I hate something, then it's that kind of shit music. And there was all these death metal bands... Yeah, uh, or heavy metal bands like all of a sudden had like bonus track Depeche Mode. Like, how can you bloody cover crap like that? Yeah, you know? I what know. do you expect me? What do you expect me to do from that? With us? we're going to cover Bronski beat or something? You know, like, <laughs> never, never in my bloody life. I mean, and I just don't understand. I do understand that you yeah. have um, uh, that you like a similar, no, that you like a different kind of music. But of for me, for me, I can absolutely not give a link. From, from a music like Depeche Mode and, and, and metal in general. For me, it's, yeah. easier, it's easier to put a link to blues music uh, yes. or jazz to, to metal than, than to that technical crap, really. You know? But all yeah. right. I, maybe, I agree. Maybe, maybe they grew up in, 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 you know, when they were kids or something, they heard it on the radio, and maybe there's some kind of influence for them, you know, uh, un, un, how you say that, unconscious. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, when, I, yeah. when I was I, a kid, I, 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 I don't know exactly what your age is, but you know, when, when I was... I'm 50 now. Uh, okay, so a couple of, yeah, it's a couple of years. Maybe those couple of years are a little bit of a difference because I had like all the sisters at home and um, I, I do remember, I mean, so I was born in 66, so I was three, three years old, 69, but yeah. still in that period, like end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s, there were no crap albums, no matter what style of music it was. May it be soul, may it be uh, rock music, may it be everything, you know, like hard rock came up, yeah. but, or country, you name it. But the, the quality of the music was good. There was no yeah. shit. Yeah, and, very and, honest. And, the, and, and in the 80s, that's when, you know, the, the whole commercial thing started rolling and it was all kinds of crap, like wham coming out, you know, really yeah, rubbish, just, yeah. uh, you know, just to sell and to make money quickly. But no matter, so uh, no matter, I mean, I, yes, I heard commercial music on the radio for those days, but it was still good quality, you know, yeah. no matter how you twist or turn that. Well, those, um, it, it's strange, but Europe, I noticed, really likes a lot of that 80s um I don't know what the hell it's like the eighties kind of music, like the, yeah, the wham kind of stuff. And I, I don't know, I guess the Pesci, I can't even think of what the names like tears for fears, bands like that stuff. Like I, I just don't, I never really got into, I mean, I was into metal oh at that time and I had no interest in that, but, but every time I go to Europe, you know, uh, you know, clubs or either like, you know, <laughs> after our show or something like that, you know, it turns into a eighties uh, techno night or something like that, or, some crazy, you know, and it's, I mean, it's getting popular here too, that, that 80s stuff. And I don't know, I just, I mean, I, I heard a lot of it just because I used to watch MTV waiting for like a good video to come on. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but, 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 but I never got into it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think there was a but, show uh, called Headbangers Ball. That was the only yes. metal show that we could watch. So you, be, you know, you're waiting for something called the Triple Trash Treat because <laughs> you had to, you know, like plow your fucking way all through the the glam rock, like Rat and all that bullshit and Cinderella. You're like, come on! Yeah, and then finally, uh, yes, well, well, sorry, the interview with um, whatever, like Sebastian back, uh, took too much of a day. No Triple Trash Treat today. We're like, fuck. <laughs> And you just have to close the TV out the window, you know, like, whoa. Yeah, yeah. In the States, our Ed Bangers Ball, it'd be, you'd watch the whole thing, and maybe, if you're lucky, like, the last video would be, <laughs> yes. like, Nuclear Assault or, like, um, you know, Anthrax. Maybe, maybe Creator, if you're lucky. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I, think, yeah. I think here there was always the same people, like, uh, 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 you know, like, filling in some, some like, Whatever, or calling them and saying, okay, triple trash treat. We want Celtic Frost, Slayer, and uh, what was it again? Uh, yeah, something like Nuclear Soul or whatever. Or Death Angel, you know, like yeah. Dead for Extra Souls, like was a video. So they were, they were like, oh, yeah, finally something good. <laughs> the rest of it was just rubbish. And on the radio, there was absolutely nothing. Yeah, well, I, well yeah, one thing I noticed too uh, for being in Europe is that, um, especially in Holland, the, the radio sucks. 
like really sucks. I mean, you know, they don't even have hard rock stations there. It seems like at least when I when I was there, you know, because I, I jam with uh, Frank uh, sometimes mm -hmm. uh, for some in can stuff touring and stuff. And I remember driving around and we we're I'm like, you know, maybe just turn on the rock radio or something. And, and there wasn't even that. It was like we had to listen to like I don't know what the hell it was, but some weird, weird kind of lame. <laughs> I don't know what the music was. Oh, yeah, no, it was, was, it was awful. It was awful. And, and now we got this, we got this wave of people listening to you know the music in their own language, which is the worst of all. You know, <laughs> but like, I, Dutch yeah. Dutch rap, like you know, something I hate is like Dutch spoken rap. rap not, I mean, rap is not good anyway, but Dutch Dutch rap is worse. And then we got something we call like it's it's like what the Germans do, you know, and then with Dutch language, it's like absolutely. You know, you know, yeah. you, know you, 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 you Yeah, it's, it's really not, weird. Not even, not even a bottle of whiskey helps against that. You know, you yeah. to, put yeah. an axe, smash the radio, and that's it's just it, no. It's, it's 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 weird though because I would have thought because how good the uh, metal scene is in Europe just in general compared to the states, I would have thought there would have at least been like a a classic rock radio station or something in there some of these places. There is one in the Netherlands though. There is classic Aero rock, definitely. Uh, is there okay? Yeah, there Maybe. is, there is, and and sometimes because, because yeah, I I mean nowadays when I when I drive with some guys in 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 a the car they always have like USB sticks, you know, so they play their own music, so no no radio is on. Yeah. But, uh, uh, yeah, on the rare occasions that some does a radio on, they always put like classic era rock because that's the only one. And I was uh, in, in, in when it started that thing that was like really. AOR stuff, you know, where you fall asleep or like sky radio. <laughs> nowadays, they, nowadays they play a bit rougher music as well, you know. So it's it's getting a little bit better, but not that they they will not like uh, play incantation or uh, <laughs> yeah. or or, or, or you know possess. So that's not going to happen. I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of weird because I the way the kind of country that uh, the Netherlands is, I would think that they would have had more like public access type radio kind of stuff there, local radio, because they do have a lot of like, you know, like shows, like social clubs and stuff. And I know they have other like kind of just like benefits for musicians and stuff like that. I just would have thought there would have been more of a variety of like, you know, public radio or something. I don't know. Maybe, you know, that's just my opinion. But. No, no, I don't think. I think that the, the kids and 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 every and, and just the metalheads in general, they hardly listen to anything to radio. I think they just you know read magazines, yeah. uh, of course, like search internet for new albums, all that kind of stuff, and that's that's what they hear. You know? Yeah. And like I said, in the car, yeah, they put on a CD or because uh, you know it's hard to bring your record player into your car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, but uh, yeah, and, and so I mean personally myself, I never listen to bloody radio. Never. Why should I? You know, I've got like yeah. an enormous music collection. So, you know, I'm, I'm not more get aggravated by some DJs not playing what I want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I can actually. I could actually do that myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hear you. Well, that'd be pretty awesome to have to hear a uh, Martin Van Duren uh, radio <laughs> radio show. That'd be pretty awesome. But, <laughs> this, but is radio, uh, this is radio ultimate death. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, anyway, um, oh well, one quick question too. This it was off the uh, my original idea of what to talk about, but it just brought up that you said on the new album you're. Um, really satisfied with your vocals and I did have a question about your vocals because I mean without trying to be uh too much of a kiss ass I mean you, you know I, I definitely <laughs> think one of your you know your vocals are probably one of the best in uh, death metal in my opinion and I think a lot of other people you know really respect um you know your vocal style and I just wonder because it it, it seems so strange sounding like you have you have that uh, it kind of, it's almost like it reminds me of a death metal Motorhead mixed with a little uh, classic Chuck Schuldner in it, mm -hmm. but it just has that like strange where it just seems like after the show your voice would be like uh, not be able to talk, you know. I mean, even when you're just, even on some of the older material that you did, it almost sounds like you're just at that border of pushing it to like lose your vocals, but you don't, you know, it never happens or whatever. I mean, how do you, how do you 
keep with that style for, for so long. And, you know, especially if you're doing a string of dates, it seems like it'd be torturous, but I never hear you have a problem. I mean, every time I've seen you play or talk to you, you always sound like, you know, your voice is fine. I know when I tour, holy crap, you know, if I, if I strain my voice a couple of days, I'm, you know, barely able to freaking talk, you know, I, it's like, I guess, I guess I'm just jealous because some people seem to just be good at it regardless of whatever. But I was just curious. I mean, do you ever have problems like that with your voice? Well, first of all, I've got now your, your, your tongue is like brown. You know that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. No, it's no, just right, being no. honest, though, you know? Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I really appreciate that, especially from like a you know good good uh, good colleague uh, like you. Thanks a lot for that. Yeah. But problems. Of course, I do have problems. Um, uh, but the thing is, like, like we, we, you know, we were discussing um, before with aspects. We, we you know we play a lot of weekend shows, as we call it. So you don't have that problem of touring that you have to go, um, you know, five days afterwards still on stage. The thing is, though, for example, with South America, I noticed that unfortunately the last, I mean, it was 10 days and then 10 days, um, yeah, flying. And for me, um, I don't know how it is with you, but like this dry air in aeroplanes is really, yeah, really, that's... really, I mean, there's nothing you can do about it, nothing. So what happened is that unfortunately it was like a big, um, it was actually a free festival in Colombia. So everybody could get in free. So it was an enormous crowd. Yeah. Unfortunately there, I didn't have a good voice, but it was just, you know, due to all the, yeah, you know, it was really intense, uh, all the flying, hardly any sleep, that kind of yes. stuff. But yes, and that was after 10 days. And there's, there's nothing you can do to to avoid things like that and train. And I, I remember in the past where we did extensive tours, there's always was this point, especially in the beginning of the tour, like after five or six days, um, where it started to, yeah, where you start to get a bit trouble, like it was, you know, because, yeah. yeah it was too much of a strain on it but then you just continue and then a couple of days break. after it's it's it, now it's no break at all you just have to continue because there was no days off back yeah then. no i'm saying you break you break yeah. in your voice it's like almost that, like you pass that point yeah. or, i don't know how to explain it and then and then and then a couple of days later it's completely restored again and then you can go on forever you know and yeah. unless you unless you catch a cold or something really bad happens but yeah, the thing is, I mean, f for the rest, I've I've never lost it, you know. In in a, in a way of, um, uh, let's put it this way, I, I never lost it when I train at my home or when the guys say, okay, now uh, uh, Martin, you still need to start recording for the album. I'm always prepared and it's always there, you know. And if yeah. they would, say, if they would say, um, like, oh, uh, Martin, uh, we got a show tomorrow. Okay, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> you know, I can go. Yeah, yeah. Straight but it's, it has also to do with the fact that I'm, I do train it a bit at home. I, you know, I can, I can do that. Yeah, with my own technique yeah. so that that's a good thing and yeah i'm just well i guess i'm also a bit blessed you know with it and i'm i'm really grateful for it too you know after all these years nothing has happened well it has changed a little bit you know i mean these really high tones that i had on the first asterix albums um i can't reach those anymore but for that i can go deeper yeah but due to getting older you know and all the drinking and smoking cigarettes that you do you know it's like well you hear like the, the young John Lee Hooker and hear the old John Lee Hooker. You know? it's, like, well, <laughs> it's a bit like that. You know? Yeah, but it still has a good, um, I mean, it, it still sounds great. I mean, I know for myself, uh, definitely drinking a lot of water helps with uh, hydrating uh, vocals, you know, especially when you, you're traveling, especially airplanes. and uh, It's terrible. Sometimes even on buses and stuff like that, the air, when when it's you, you're know, traveling in the wintertime, I notice that. The heat just dries out. I have to actually put a dehumidifier in the bunk and stuff because, I mean, it just it just totally screws me up. Plus, I know sleep is probably the biggest thing. Like, if I get no sleep, like the next yeah. day, I'm, I'm sometimes trashed. Hopefully, it just really a bit, sucks. I mean, it makes sense because I mean, you need to. It's like it's like doing a you know like sports. You, your yeah. body needs recovery, and the best recovery you can get is, is during sleep, of course. Yeah. So if you don't sleep, your voice will not recover. Simple. Yeah. It's, 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 like a thing if and that's why for example I, or, or probably why i also lost it or well not really lost it but it was not as good as it should be in Colombia yeah. because we hardly slept you know yeah that's plus, that's plus always the worst plus all this plain stuff you know but yeah you know what nowadays the big change between um like the early days and now is that i never liked back then i never liked to be in a studio because you got this weird kind of pressure there was not you know not yet but nowadays completely now i just go into the studio and i have fun as well you know i go okay 
just for the sake of, you know, just here's some good music by the guys. I may, I have to make the best out of it. Everybody's counting on me and I'm just doing it. Um, yeah, with pleasure, you know, with fun. Uh, that, that's yeah. for example where we kept the laugh on Botox Implosion because I was, you know, having the lyrics in front of me. Like, okay, now we got, we got this one coming. Yeah. So I, I laughed and they go, hey, this is cool. Keep it. Well, that's a, that's a good it, thing. That's a good thing to have that, that positive, happy vibe, doing it for, you know, being positive in the studio helps so much, I think, to make an album great. Exactly, exactly, and and I think that's that, that that you can also hear that on this album as as a bit of a you know to to get to the very first thing is that you can you can really hear that this is a band that that you know loves to play the material that they were recording and and also that I mean we're also like a band of brothers you know it's it's more than just a band Essex is really yeah like a brotherhood you know yeah. a family and and um, I think you can hear that too you know I, and that's a difference also that you have. Because there's a lot of bands out there also that that are built like around you know one guy and then you know they change all the time between all kinds yes. of musicians, and I I think that that doesn't I mean yes of course you they can they can grow as as a band and a unit, but it takes all, always a while you know and we are now yes well this this lineup is I think six or seven years now together yeah and um so yeah the, 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 yeah I mean everybody everybody has to be on a similar page. Exactly. In the band too. If 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 there's just if it's a, if it's not gelling properly, it just doesn't it doesn't progress right because people aren't getting what they what they want out of it, you know. Exactly, exactly. So. And 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 the, the cool thing is that that's why with us, you know, this is really like different because uh, yeah, we all, you know, no one goes, and of course you always need you know that you have to perform your best when you are in the studio, but you can still do that while having a good time. You yeah, know. I agree. You know. um, okay, well, I, I had a question. I my memory doesn't serve me correctly, so I'm trying to. I was trying to remember the first time you came to the U.S. or it was in your former band Pestilence. Mm -hmm. you, I think you toured for Consuming Impulse in the states, but if I I can't I can't remember for the for the hell of it who you toured with, and I I think I. I think you guys played the Sundance in Long Island. I, for some reason, I think you played Lemoore's too, but I tried to look it up online and I didn't see that listed. I only seen about what five or six dates. I, I thought it was a longer tour than that. Would you please uh, yes. let me know what's up with that? Oh, no, that's a long story. I mean, first of all, the package was a uh, Death Carcass Pestilence. Yeah, that's what I thought it was. When I looked yeah. it up on on like some of the archive sites, I, it didn't say death and carcass, and I, I swore it was with death and carcass, and I, I, I didn't see it, so I was like, fuck, am I going crazy? Like, Because I, I remember there was the death and uh, Dark Angel uh, tour they did, and I couldn't, you know, I don't know. It's just, it just, there's so many shows I've seen back then I couldn't remember. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the thing is, what the, what, what, what the problem was with us is, unfortunately, is that um, we missed a lot of shows, especially on the East Coast, because uh, we were waiting in Amsterdam at Patrick Utenweg's place for the visas of the American embassy. And it oh. took them quite a while. So we flew in and we started a tour in the most beautiful city of the, Ameri of the, of the United States, Detroit. Right. <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a shitty place called Blondie's. Oh, wow. Jesus. That was a rough area. Holy crap. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was that was really bad. That was really bad. It's a classic like, oh, club in a, a rough area. Wow, it's a bad start. Yeah, yeah. So we go like, okay, welcome to the United States. You know, so we go like, okay, so <laughs> your first got, time, right? We got, we, got, we got the third world, so probably this is like called the second world then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you keep. That, and that's then, so funny. And then, and then the best was the best part was that um, uh, uh, I think it was Carcass. They had like some kind of strange tour manager called Woody. And he smashed up the RV that we were supposed to share with them. So we had no RV. What the we had fuck? nothing. And it was, I don't think the carcass played in Detroit. <laughs> and uh, and so we were like, I think we had the next day Minneapolis or something. And then we go, but how the hell are we going to get to Minneapolis now then? <laughs> and then all of a sudden there was there was some. I don't, I'm not sure it was if, if it was in from Detroit to Minneapolis or some other city. Could be too, huh? Yeah. But. Um, in the end, we were like sitting in some kind of, he had like a, a big Dodge van, like a cab driver with a Dodge uh, van. Yeah. And we just, for the, for the joke of it, we said, um, how much would it would it take, cost us to, 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 you know, for you to drive us to Minneapolis? 
<laughs> he looks at us like if we're from some other planet. And then he and then he, and he asks like he asks like his uh you know his boss and we could actually hear the radio. He goes, I've got some guys that want to know how much it's gonna cost to Minneapolis. And then he goes out of the speaker like, Are you fucking kidding me? And then he and then he turns around and says like six hundred bucks. And we go and we didn't have any money at all, but you know, but we were thinking like, well, we, we were informing prices of the Greyhound. <laughs> which was basically the same, like hundred dollars each. No, so, we go, well, rough. Wow. so we go, so we go like, you know what? Well, we we might as well do this, and then at least in the way we can stop, you know, instead of in this city bus with yeah. all kinds of bums, you know. So the guy, so the guy drove us in a cab all the way to Minneapolis. <laughs> <laughs> Wow! <laughs> yeah, and then and that was our, that was our, that was that was all our food money actually because we, had to, we had to we had to buy ourselves in that tour oh. for ten men to, to the death. And oh wow! Yeah, we actually borrowed that money from a friend of ours, so we had nothing. We completely, completely broke. <laughs> that's a brutal. That's a brutal start. Holy crap! Especially uh, yeah. that's terrible though to to buy on a tour for ten grand and then have visa fucking problems. Ah, oh, that's yeah. that. That's that's the worst case scenario. Holy crap! <laughs> yeah, we lost a lot. We, we lost a lot of show, but we still we did really a lot too. Right? I mean, places that I think you can't even go there anymore nowadays to play because it it yeah it it, it you maybe get like twenty people visit. I mean, we I think we went to Indianapolis, like I said, in Minneapolis. No, I don't see anybody. But we did. I think we did Chicago as well. Fortunately, that was fat. So well, yeah. it was it was really a good tour for us because. Yeah, we sold a shitload of merchandise, and from that, uh, we were almost able to pay the whole ten grand back to the family. <laughs> yeah, not owe too much, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was hard. It was really rough. It was really rough. I remember that there were days when Chuck um, uh, it was really bad. I, I remember we drove. I think we had a drive from Denver all the way to Portland. Mm -hmm. And he kept on pulling shows. He just didn't want to play in Boise and all that. We we're like, come on, we need we need shows, <laughs> oh, you know. And he goes, yeah. no, I don't want to play. So he just canceled them because he didn't want to play. It was like really ridiculous. Yeah. But in, but in those days, uh, when we had no no show, we had no food either. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's so a way it, bigger yeah. deal for you guys than it was for him. So, you so, know? We, so we actually we sometimes actually had to steal like food. <laughs> <laughs> it's like damn. Yeah. Well. Uh, yeah. I mean. I, I never knew Chuck really well, so I you know I can't really say, but he did seem like he was very kind of moody sometimes on things like yeah. that, and just really make some. I, I I think really he he wasn't a super big fan of touring overall, at least at certain times in the career. Because I know he had he had the debacle even going over to Europe that one time what was it for spiritual healing? I think it was, <coughs> yeah. you know, which which was just insane. I mean, you know, I I don't know the details on it, all that stuff but just it just seems like he had definitely has a reputation of not being super excited about uh, touring necessarily you know but um what was it as far as i mean a, a, a tour like that in general i mean did you guys you know get along okay with the uh, carcass and death guys for the most part was that was death on a human was it maybe i'm not sure no, it was no, no spiritual healing Oh, spiritual healing. That, okay. that, that, yeah. that, that was our good luck, so we were able to blow them away every night. <laughs> yeah. And, and they had like, and they had like the worst merchandise you can imagine. You know, they had like white T-shirts with the spiritual healing cover, so no one was buying that. I remember, yeah. I remember those shirts. That was terrible looking. <laughs> exactly. So no one was buying that. So you know, we were lucky. Like, okay, finally we can get a little bit of money. You know, from the merchandise. Yeah. And you guys, and you guys, and, and to be fair, I mean, consuming impulse was a. Uh, at least in the states, a really big um, statement of an album. I mean, it was definitely everybody knew it, everyone liked it, everybody was waiting to see you guys play at that time. It was kind of like, in my opinion, the time was right for what you were doing. I mean, Pestilence was musically was you know in a great spot where okay, it had a little bit of technicality to it, but it still had a lot of really killer, catchy, chunky riffs to it. It, it was just a really it, you know, if, if things would have stayed together and worked out or whatever, it, it definitely would have probably, you know, easily become in the ballpark of something like death or whatever, because it was just right in that sweet spot of what the fans wanted. But it was still catchy enough for, um, you know, the more novice um, death metal fan at that time to get into. It's like it was like almost like a, good for beginners, but also had enough 
meat in there for the uh, diehard death metal kids, you know? Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. That's why, you know, and I mean, the thing is, like, that tour, the reason why we did it and brought ourselves in was just to uh, get some foot on, on, on American ground, you know, mm-hmm. and, then to, and to show them there uh, that we're not just making a good album, but that live, we, we were a statement as well, you know, and we, we showed that during that tour. And then we also, the idea was a little bit, okay, then the first tour is probably going to cost us a lot, but then maybe we're able to next time we come over to be to headline. And what yes. happened a lot was a lot of promoters, local ones, that came up to us after the show and go like, you know, guys, next time you come over here, you know, you play headline in. So, yeah, we were actually building something up and it went really well, you know. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, after <laughs> that, you know, no. split happened, but, <laughs> you know. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's another story, of course. But yeah, it was it was definitely really going well, really, really well for us. And uh, the fun part is, is that um, we, we really got really well along with Carcass because we shared an RV with them. So we were, oh. we, you know, we were with them with them all the time and they yeah. had their own. And what was, Car- Car- what was Carcass on tour for? Um, was what was it? The second, Symphonies? The second again? Symphonies second. of Sickness? No, no, the one after. Oh, the necrot- necroticism. Yes, yes, that's one. I think. Okay. That one, that one I think. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, but it was yeah, it was, we we really really had good fun with Cargos. They're really um, yeah, just nice guys, you know. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and also the two um, the guys who were like kind of crew and driving, like Louis Carrizales and then Walt Traxler. Walt was in like I think Rotting Corpse. And Louis was oh, in. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I know those guys. Yeah. And Louis was, I think, in Texas Devastation. So, and they were really cool guys. I mean, we really had a good time with them. So, you know, um, yeah. it was really rough. But you know, if you keep on laughing and making good shows, you know, every night is, you know, you don't care. It's just okay. At, like, well, at least, you know, at least I had my beers every night, so I was happy with that. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, then that- so there was a point where Carcass came to us and said, "Poor guys, you know, um, I think it's better if we swap bill because." Um, you know, we have no chance after this really happened. You can you can still ask Jeff Walker. Um, Jeff came to me and said, Martin, I think it's better if we swap the bill because uh, you guys blow us away every night. So, you know, you mind if, you mind if we open? We go, no, you know, <laughs> thanks a lot. Of course right. not. <laughs> nice, nice one, you know. So that, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Things like things like that happened, really. So there was, yeah. Was amazing. Awesome. Yeah. And no, and, and awesome. of course experience eh? because the, the venues were full, they were packed. Yes. Um yeah, from everywhere we were, you know, even even Wichita, you know. Yeah, <laughs> well, I mean, like I said, that I mean that that almost re- I think it was released on Roadrunner, right? In the US. Uh, yeah, I mean that was a, a really big deal. I mean, at, like I said, everyone I knew really loved that album. Um I mean it was just yeah, it was just one of those albums, it was impossible not to like it there's not many albums that kind of you know walks that tightrope between um you know thrash technicality and death metal all kind of in the same thing and people from all those places could feel 100 percent connected to but somehow that album did it because most fans that had a little bit uh, too much thrash in it just would turn off the death metal people mm-hmm. or you know vice versa you know so it was really it was really one of those interesting albums that was really really brought you know kind of the whole the whole uh, extreme scene together which is kind of kind of a cool thing um yeah and i, I could see definitely bringing you know some of the more underground people to the show too because at that time um you know the death spiritual healing album was definitely not uh, super big with the underground people it was more they were they were going for a, a kind of a newer kind of uh, fan base at the time you know new, newer kids getting it just maybe just getting into death metal kind of album that is at least in my opinion it's kind of like i guess one of those like uh, gateway albums we'll say for for kids getting into death metal especially back then it was kind of considered yeah. that but so i mean you guys definitely kind of brought the brutality it's even carcass i mean that uh, was kind of getting more um more refined at that time too you know so yeah. uh it would you, you know it wasn't it, but it was a smart a great a smart tour to be on a really good tour yeah i was just curious about that because i i can't i i know i probably 
I mean, after you saying it, it reminds me of the, um, you know, stuff that happened, some of the stuff I knew about, but it was just was too long ago. And, and, and you know, some of those tours matched together in my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, yeah that, that, that had to have been still an awesome experience. Um, but, uh, okay, well, a c- couple other things I was wanting to get at, too, was just curious about, like, the super old school scene in Holland, um, or Netherlands, I'm sorry. Um, I... Matter. <laughs> I don't well, it know. Does, it does matter, but it's 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 normal that people make the mistake. Everyone calls it Holland, and it's actually in the Netherlands, you know. Yes, but yes, I think Holland, part of aware of it's part of part of Netherlands. Like Holland is a part of the Netherlands, or something to that extent. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, but anyway, the scene back then. I mean, you know, I would say, you know, as far as I'm aware of, and I, I don't know, I don't know my Dutch death metal in that era as well as maybe I should. But um, I think Pestilence might be one of the first uh, death metal bands in Holland. I mean, I know there's thrash bands that were aggressive before that, but um, I mean, what was the scene like back then for starting off as, if not the, the first, one of the first death metal bands over there? But it was, there was not, it was not big, huh? I, I must, I must say though, I mean, uh, like the real, the first uh, extreme like death crash band was Thanatos. Okay. So that's that's my my ex colleague Stefan. You know. Yeah. The bullets. When did they, uh, when they, did they, they start were, out? Uh, I think they did eighty four. Really? That old? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I think their first, their first. Yeah. I think their first the first demo like the Speed Kills one. Um, that's from eighty four, I think. And Pestilence's first demo was eighty six. But yeah. Um, yeah, Pestilence, of course. Like I think they started like in eighty five, but I joined in eighty seven. You know, but okay. yeah, back then there was not really a big scene in the Netherlands. It was, um, uh, yeah, there were things growing, but there was still not um, a lot of extra metal. We did have, you know, some speed metal bands, you know, things like Vulture and, um, yeah, but Thanatos was, was really the first that, uh-huh. that, that made it like into the extremities. And then when we started, um, yeah, there was like a kind of a small boom coming up, like with bands like Deadhead. Uh, yeah, but they were, more, they were more fresh, and that turned also a bit into altar. There were smaller bands that, um, yeah, I think like Dead End, but it's not really known. Yeah, 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 because I think that we played with them somewhere in the south of the Netherlands, and then later on, there was the only band in um, in Amsterdam, Theory Act. That's where we found uh, Uter, Peter Uterweg from. But there was the only band in Amsterdam, like <laughs> actually, but because Amsterdam is really not a it's really not a city for metal, you know. It's, it's yes. really more like for trendies, you know. Yes. And, and uh, so, so Rotterdam is actually better because, yeah, it's a big harbor city. So you got, you know, like tough people with hard work, hard labor. And here in the region, where we're from, because I'm living in in the center of the Netherlands, but then really close to the German border. And I was like, um, um, yeah, it was it was a lot of like um, I say that like uh, clothing factories, you know, really hard labor with with uh, textile stuff. Yeah. So that's so I think that that kind of um, similar to you know with the new wave of British heavy metal, which kind of was triggered because of the closing of all the mines and a big like uh, wave of unemployment, and that's where you know kids start to get bored. And, okay, let's just get all your frustrations out that you have, and and you you, you, you know you start a band. And our wave was like later than that, of course. Yeah. It's a bit similar. So yeah, in this region, um, yeah, because. F- f- when I joined, when I joined Pestilence, Asterix also started, you know. So then, yeah. then all of a sudden, then you got like the two bands coming from the same area, and there was a few other smaller ones. Like uh, later on, Randy left Pestilence and started Sacrosanct, which was mm-hmm. um, also from from people from this area, which turned later into something called Genetic Wisdom. Um, so yeah, but it was not really a big, um, you know, things like Got Dethroned and and all these kind of bands. You know, they came a bit later than that. They, yeah. came, they were more like starting 90s. Well, was there, what, like, like when I look back at like the early scene when I was playing in my former band Revenant, we would, we would basically, I mean, we weren't really death metal. We were, we had aspects of death metal in our music. We were kind of still trying to find ourselves, but I mean, we were playing a lot of shows. Our shows were like with hardcore bands, with uh, punk bands, with. Uh, generic thrash bands. I mean, there wasn't many bands until we really found like a band like Ripping Corpse or something that was like playing kind of extreme music. You know, we were we were kind of on our own with that, but we did. You know, we found more of a uh, actual following 
in like the punk and the hardcore fan base than we did with the, the metal and thrash. I mean, we even had, you know, we're, I'm from New Jersey, so we had like the poser scene. So, I mean, we played shows opening for poser bands where people would just look at us like we're, we're from Mars or something like that, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, yeah. did you have that kind of situation there too? Like where, where yes. you were just like, yeah, okay. Oh, no, and, and the thing is, I completely forgot because it's really good to uh, remind me of that. Is that there was, of course, also here like a big, um, um, I say that like a fusion, you know, between yeah the hardcore, the punks, the metalheads, because basically in the end it was all like loud music, you know, we're just kicking against the establishment with all, with all yes. we're doing. So yes, we were also um, um, playing with uh, yeah strange and hardcore kind of bands, you know, like lunatics without skateboards or, and there were. Uh, yeah, there were also Dutch bands like Jewel, which is more hard rock, heavy metal. And like you say, you know, all of a sudden you you're opening up for these guys, and people look at you like, "What the hell is this shit noise?" You know, like, "Come on, yeah. okay, we listen." But yes, we had, a, we had a pride in that though. You know, back then we were like, <laughs> if people if we played like a really lame bill, we'd be like, we'd be proud of people. We pissed people off. We we'd just do it just to be dicks. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> I must I must say you know when we uh, of course there were already albums out like you know Creators Pleasure to Kill or Destruction yes. you know uh, Sodom and that so um, there was already like uh, something really extreme triggered you know that, but that, that, yes. not, not just not not yet in the Netherlands really yeah, yeah well I've, I mean you you guys are close enough to Essen so you probably had some bleed over from that to some extent but I mean even though I mean we had a lot of bands come by. Um, you know, our scene too, like bigger bands like Carnivore and Voivod right. and a bunch of these bands would play, but there was still a divide between like, you know, to get on a show with Voivod back in, I don't know, 87 for Revenant was just a dream come true, you know, but it wouldn't happen, you know, like we had to, we had to play, you know, whatever, like the, the crappy club, any crappy club we could find that would just let us play a show and just find a few other bands and have us, you know, whatever, you know, just, just yeah. make something happen. So, so, I mean, I don't know if it was like that for, for you, cause I know for us, like a, a band like us, we didn't get any respect in our, like for the promoters or anything. They looked at us like we were just out of our freaking minds, you know, they, they'd rather book the, the local Metallica cover band to open up yeah. for a creator when they're here instead of a band like us, which we were always frustrated with, but you know, I didn't know if we had that kind of problem in, you know, for, for you guys when you guys were starting, you know? Um, yeah, well, I mean, with, with the demos and all of a sudden the second demo, it sold really well, you know, just by mail and, you know, how it went back then, you know, you, yes. really sold, you really had to send your tape by actual mail to people who, yes. bought, who bought the demo. So we kind of gained a follow. And fortunately for us, living close to the German border and with this um, fresh boom in, in, in happening in Germany, so we got some offers. Not much, you know, like, but we were able to play. So all of a sudden we found ourselves in way in the south of Germany, a 10 hour drive. And we played with something called Darkness. And uh, yeah, that was oh, really I remember expensive. them, yeah. Exactly. And there was one of these bands where we go like, well, you know, yes, <laughs> they, they just try to feed on, on the success of Destruction and Sodom and Creator and, and you know, all these things. So mm -hmm. I remember we played in a venue and it was packed with 500 people. And I think we sold about 100 demos in one night, you know. And wow. So you gain, you gain a short following. And then we got into, we met some guys from Atrocity, the Germans. So okay. they arranged, so so they arranged some. We became really good friends. So I arranged some, they arranged some shows for us. So what happened for us? It went really, it went faster in Germany than it went in the Netherlands, really. Yeah. So so we gained a following there that was stronger than we had over in 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 back in our own country. But still, we were able to do a couple of shows. And one thing was, it was a fantastic initiative. It was not far away from here, about 40 kilometers. And they made all of a sudden like an extreme metal festival. And I think headlining was Creator. Uh, there was Holy Moses. Uh, Thanatos played there. We played there. And apparently, but unfortunately, they didn't come. Inf Infernal Majesty were on the bill too. Oh, wow. And we were like, oh, God, and we played together with the Federal Majesty. Oh. And then all of a sudden, short before the thing, oh, no, they can't make it, la, 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 la. So we got a shit. So we decided, you know, because we bloody love that first album, still do, you know, the yes. One Shall Defy. So we decided to, um, you know, to cover um, um, Night of the Living Dead. Oh, awesome. So, 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 we, so we played it there, yeah. Well, it, was, uh. it was a was really a fantastic festival, uh, absolutely. But we were like, really small because... Yeah, you know, we, all the other bands were way bigger than us, but uh, yeah, it was it was really great. It was really great, and that was uh, like an exception thing. And then 
the venue where we practiced, the attack venue in Enschede, um, we had a deal with them that we didn't have to pay for the practice room, but for that, uh, we have to do at least one show a year there. Oh, and then, and then, that's a good you know, deal. It was, it was a fantastic deal. So in the beginning, you know, no one showed up. But finally, you know, you got a little bit big and all of a sudden we packed it all the time. So it was, yeah. But, but the venue was really, um, like everything was playing there. It, it was comparable to what you now have in Rotterdam in Baruch. Like oh, every yeah. band played there now. But back in the days, there was nothing happening in Rotterdam when it came to shows, but it was all in the attack venue in Enschede. Everybody played there, from Nocturnus to Morbid Angel to Napalm Death to, to uh, the, whatever, you name it, to, 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 to no, not Chromax, but um, damn, Wehrmacht, you know, all these kind of bands, they all play there. But also, oh, wow. also things like UK Subs or Swans or, you know, stuff like that. So you could just, there was basically almost a show like every day there, you know. Yeah. So that, was that was really great. And that's, yeah, coming from there, you can just go to shows and you meet people or you hang out with bands and then you, you know, you, you establish contact or whatever, or you just, you know, meet guys that you, you know, you've been writing with like for, you know, some, some, some quite a while. So, yeah, it was, um, I think there was a, you know, it, it was just being there at the right moment at the right time also. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, was there, did you get a chance to see bands like, um, you know, some of the tours with like Celtic Frost and, Boy, Bond, I think they did one, or maybe well, uh, bands like Creator Live a lot, like yeah, yeah. Pleasure to Kill and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Creator, we saw the Creator Voivod one. Yeah. They were, they were together with Voivod. And yeah. uh, we had things here, like there was the, 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 the pre Dynamo Festival, which was still indoors. It was called Aatschok Dach. Okay. And they had, a, and I remember they had one bill. It was a Venom headlining, Metallica, uh, and Frost was there too. Oh, and wow. so, and Metallica was still for Kill 'em All. And in the demo process of Ride the Lightning, awesome. and uh, yeah, yeah, and Venom did uh, was in the black metal period, so yeah, that was. Really, <laughs> you know, I, I was still a bit of a kid. I was not even in a band back then, you know. Yeah. I, I, was, I, I, took, I went there by train. Yeah, uh, but it's yeah. great to it's had, great to get to witness that stuff in I the guess. early stages, you know. It, it kind of plants the seed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and then for for Slayer, we saw them. Uh, yeah, actually, we went to Essen, Germany, which is one and a half hour drive from here, when they just had um, uh, Raining Blood out. You know, so it was yeah, yeah big yeah. soul, big venues. So I mean, that was the that was when Slayer turned really big, and yeah, it was like thousands of people there. Uh, so yeah, we went we went to shows, and and of course to you know to the club here um you know our home ground, we could we could go there any time too. You know, so yeah, we were able to see a shit lot of bands. Fortunately. Yeah. 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 And I think it's cool too. Cause it, I mean, you know, every, every scene, I think people get a little jealous because, you know, spans that I would love to see that I could just, you know, never tour the U S toured Europe or something like, uh, say like old paradise lost or something on lost paradise. I would love to mm -hmm. see that or, um, you know, some of the other bands that would tour and uh, say earlier albums, you know, like, it just, um, yeah, I don't know. I just see some of those old flyers. I'm like, fuck. You yeah. Know? Like by the time, because by the time Paradise Lost got over here, it was for, was it Shades of God? I think they uh, toured, you know, it was already kind of, you know, they, I mean, it, I don't think they played anything off Lost Paradise. And I was like, you know, for me, when Lost Paradise came out, I was just like, oh, I was one of my favorites. I love that album, you know? It's, 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 it is a fantastic one. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah, but the thing is, it was really, I mean, we, 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 borrowed, a lot of, we borrowed a lot of money, as I told you. Eh? So for European bands, with the visa, with all the flight costs back then, you know, which was really a lot, because flights were not as, as uh, easy to do as, 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 as you can do now. You know, yeah. now the, 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 the competition between the flight companies is enormous. So, so the the flight tickets they completely, um, yeah, you know, decreased uh, throughout time in, in 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 price. So, it was almost impossible for European bands to go to the U.S. with the visa crap, where you had no guarantee even of getting it. You know, so what, what was yeah, the point of, of planning something? And then, you know, like I said before, we we were we were too late. We missed ten or fifteen or maybe more shows uh, for for the Death tour. So, uh, that I think that's why bands, yeah. In the, in the case you're talking about Paradise Lost, like, yeah, they were able to come later, but uh, yeah, during the time of Lost Paradise, they were still really a small band, you know, just yeah. like uh, just like uh, bands like Benediction or Ballthrower, you know. Yeah. I mean, we were the ones that was that was also a nice story. We were the ones at Pestilence. We set up the tour, the Blood Brother tour, where we invited Autopsy 
yes. uh, to Europe for the first time. And we started off like a bill, like pestilence, bullfrog, autopsy. And now if you talk to people about that, they go like, weird, what the fuck, you know? You're like, yeah, it was a classic tour, yeah. Exactly. I remember it even had the, the tour shirts I've seen back then. I remember seeing, I was like, holy fuck. Yeah, well, it was, it was good. For, and, and, and the reason why we started is because we were contacting, we were in contact with each other, you know, to, like, trading trips. And then all yeah. of a sudden, you go, what? If we if we pay your flight tickets to autopsy and for ball floor, it was easy. And then Eric, Eric and, and uh, Peaceville, they backed it also a little bit up with some with a little bit of cash that they had back then as, as starting yeah. labels. And it, to be honest, <laughs> it was not a really a big success financially because death metal was too young. You know, it was yeah. still not very accepted. So certain shows were fantastic and sold out. But then yeah. you could have the day after and it was like, hardly anybody. You know, yeah. But, uh, the thing is, it's good fun, and we stayed friends for the rest of our lives. And that's, of course, like you can't, you can't, yeah, you can't pay for that, you know. Yeah. So you, so you, so you guys finance that for the most part yourself, or at least set yes, it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. also with the permission of some of, of some labels, you know, like uh, yeah. like I said, Hem, Hemi from Peaceville. He, he, he just wanted to come over, you know, with because uh, <laughs> autopsy with them. Because he, he was like, okay, where's the where's the first coffee shop, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. So he, he just he, he just, yeah. The first thing he did was I like, go straight to a coffee shop and he I don't know how many how many spliffs he wrote, smoked, but I mean, <laughs> he was like stoned for the whole period that he was with us. But yeah, it was yeah. it was really cool, you know. It was really cool and. Uh, yeah, so yeah, we did it ourselves, and and uh, we were just yeah thinking of okay, why not, you know, and and just just wanted to have a good time. Yeah, well, that, I, was, I, that was okay. that was I, the first death metal package in in uh, uh, in Europe, I think. Yeah. That's awesome. I, I remember was it autopsy? Yeah, I remember doing that. They were doing that tour, and they also did the one with, with uh, Paradise Lost yes. too. I don't remember if that was on. If that was on Lost Paradise or Gothic album, but I, I think it might have been Gothic. I, I can't remember for sure, but uh, I'm not sure. It was straight. But, it was, was short after. It was a year after. I'm sure. Yeah, and that because I it mean, was that's it amazing. was a friend. It was it was a friend of Pestilence that um uh you know he was he was helping us out with all kinds of concerts, and then later on he liked that job kind of thing, and he says yeah. uh, do, not job, but he, he liked to do things like that. So he you know he got in contact with all kinds of people, and later on he turned on turned out to be the you know the most important business kind of man well he doesn't he hates that he hates to be called like that <laughs> but uh you know like he's, he was like the main booker for for ball thrower you know so um when he started that with us then he got to you know to know all kinds of people so then afterwards he said okay uh, uh, let's do this paradise lost autopsy thing because both i think both bands were in peaceville right back then yes exactly yes. so i think peaceville supported that a bit financially so it was easier for them than to set it up. But yeah, I remember hearing him doing that. Yeah. yeah. But you know, but we had no nightliners. You know, we were <laughs> bloody traveling in a small city little van. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I remember it was it was tough because it was really crazy because white. I mean, not boy, but uh, autopsy was so was so popular in the underground with the death metal heads. I mean, you know, always put at the top of the list. But uh, it was so difficult for them to get shows in the states. But they did those two tours in Europe, because uh, even, even when we finally we finally were able to get them out on the road it was the tour that we did with them in the U.S. with uh, it was like Autopsy, Us, and uh, Vital Remains, uh, oh, more cool. a few other bands, and it was a, a really it was a really fun tour, and it had some yeah. really great nights. But man, it had some rough ones too, you know. And it was just crazy because you know how amazing you know like. I always looked up the Autopsy as one of my favorites, uh, favorite bands. So, you know, I just couldn't believe that, like, you know, some of the turnouts were as, as bad as they were on, on the tour. It was just it was really disappointing, you know, because, you know, such an important band in the underground, you know, but it's, it's sad. But there's sometimes there just isn't, uh, you know, justice in this scene, you know. I mean, they're, I mean, obviously, Autopsy is doing does perfectly fine for themselves or whatever, you know, and they figured out uh, a way to make things work for the band. But it was just really sad because we were super stoked about it. I mean, for us, it was still great. I mean, just to be able to play every night and watch autopsy, we were just happy campers. You know, <laughs> you know how could you, yeah. how could you be bummed out? You know, I mean, um, I, fuck, I, everything autopsy does is great. <laughs> Like you say, you know, it's really to what we were saying. Like, that, 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 yeah, it's strange that, you know, because if Odyssey would go here now, I think the venues will be pretty packed. Oh, for sure. Yeah. It's all, it's almost a lot. I mean, I mean, you noticed it with Aspects too. It's like almost the time 
being away really helped the band out a lot, get get a lot of uh, notoriety early on. You know, you guys were fortunate enough to be able to, you know, keep it moving ahead and keeping the sincerity going with the band, you know? Um, yeah, but I think it had also to do with the fact that uh, uh, when we decided to come back, and that was, that was really a rough decision, eh? because uh, Eric Daniels, he didn't want to do it. He was in, uh, yeah, his, his mindset was just not you know, right for it. So he said, no, I can't. So then, yeah, of course, first and me, for me and Bob, it was like, okay, impossible without Eric. So coincidentally, we, 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 we stumbled against Paul and he was a fantastic replacement. Yeah. But then, you know, it was like years after years, the parties on festival came with an offer, you know, because yeah. they did like kind of a poll among the, the, the audience. And every year it was like, which band you would like to see next year on next year's parties on edition. And every time was asterisk, asterisk, asterisk on top. So they kept on asking Bob every year. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, and then, and then finally we were able to say, like, okay, we'll do it. Yeah, and I remember that was you know, so we knew how important it was, and we could see that whole field was packed, and it was just, <laughs> you, could actually, you could drop a needle that that quiet how it was when we were here walking on stage, and it was really scary. Yeah, and so but we, we delivered well, and then I think that was the the whole thing, you know, that they would they could actually see like okay, there were high expectations. But um, we lived up to it, you know, we yeah. did it. And so then you got like, of course, like the mouth to mouth um, advertisement, you know, to, to, for people like, oh, wow, they were great. They were great. And all of a sudden we had no idea because it was supposed to be just one show. And, okay. And quit, you know, that, that's it. Then we <laughs> go back yeah. home and you know, continue with our lives. And then after it was like a roller coaster, uh, offer after offer after offer after offer. And then a couple of jam sessions we did we became with some new material okay why not you know and boom there you go and yeah it, it just it just happened but yeah like i said you know we live are an intense band we we keep on um you know putting up good albums i think yeah so um yeah that's that's uh that that's what yeah well, and, and, well, yeah, what, that, that, uh, yeah go ahead no i was gonna say well, i it was still st really strange to me, though, um, honestly, when um, Juana sent me the uh, Death the Brutal Way, like an advanced copy of it, and said that they were looking for a label to put it out. Uh, I heard it, and I was just like, holy fuck, this is a great album. You know, like, I was totally blown away. And I'm like, I have... What do, you, what do you mean St. Jeremy doesn't want to put this out? I mean, what are they, did it have ears? You know, I'm, I didn't get it, but I was, you know, I talked to her, I was like, okay, you know, whatever. If you, you know, if they don't want to put it out, I mean, of course I'll be more than happy to do it in the States. I mean, I'm not, I'm not dumb. I'm not going to say no to something so great, but I was, it was, it was really mind boggling that, um, you know, I may, maybe because you just played, you know, in Europe, you know, at the party summit and maybe they thought the buzz was just there and not in the States. But, you know, when I heard it, I knew that, like, when people hear this album, you know, I just knew that people were going to dig it. I mean, I, I had no idea that it would be something as, you know, a kind of go like wildfire, like it ended up going, um, you know after a little while, but I was still really surprised that uh, Century Media didn't want to put it out at first. It just seemed really, um, yeah. really strange, you know? I mean, such a, I mean, because it was a really great comeback album, I think, for you guys. Um, you know, it, it was, it was, had a lot of the stuff that was great about, um, you know, the, the album, but at the same time, I mean, the band, but also did have some new uh, aspects to it. You could tell that, you know, a little bit different songwriting style at certain parts, but it all seemed to make total sense, you know, and it was just a good, good headbanger of an album. Great way to come back, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, I remember that one, but, you know, yeah, it was cool because we, we, we knew too, you know, if we're going to do something, it better be good. <laughs> <You know? laughs> no, really, no it, you know, you just, but the cool thing is, is that, it was, of course, an enormous pile of um, pressure on, on Paul's shoulders. All of a sudden, he was carrying the band with his riffs. Yeah. yeah so that must, have been, that must have been really rough for him. And, and, you know, there's a big difference between Paul now, who's really a confident, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, member of Asterix and, and maybe like the most important member but with, with delivering all the riffs. But yeah, back then he came with all the material. And I don't know. He probably had that shit up his sleeves like for years and he couldn't put it anywhere, you know. <laughs> yeah. 
But uh, yeah, I remember we just had a great time in the practice room with me, Bob, and Kuzmanis couldn't always make it because he was, um, yeah, he, he, for him it was like a two, two and a half, and a half drive. But yeah, for me, Paul and and, uh, and Bob, it was easier to sometimes, you know, during the week say, okay, let's just meet, you know, and let's just jam a little bit. And then, yeah, it, it just came all of a sudden. Uh, I think the first song he did was Death of Root Away and then We Doom You to Death, I think, was the second. No, no, We Doom You was later. No, the first was Death of Root Away, yeah. Yeah, and, and then we made, we made a single out of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's just uh, yeah. I mean, it's always it's always nerve wracking. I think if you have a you know first comeback album, and you know, I mean, I figure probably Eric Daniels was probably a a, a main songwriter in the band. I mean, I, I don't know the dynamics of it, but yeah, just, the thing uh, is, the thing is, uh, with with the rack. There was the rec was like a scrap up of songs and all kinds of material from God knows how many different lineups. Yeah. But when it was the last one, it was me and Eric basically. Yeah. You know? So yeah. Uh, and then later on, yes, it was Eric who delivered most of the riffs. Yes, definitely. So yeah, like you say, you know, later on, all of a sudden, bam, it was on Paul's shoulders. And I, yeah, I, I, could, I, I could, yeah, I could deliver the riffs, but I was like, oh, well, you know, this this kid is delivering everything that we need, so why the hell? <laughs> there's no point in in me, you know, like interfering here. But the thing is that I'm I'm always really strong and full with the arrangement of things. So if he comes yeah. with a riff, I, I can say, tell immediately, okay, this is used for vocals. This is going to be a bridge or, uh, or can, can you play this six times or seven times or eight times, you know, because yeah. Essex is not doing seven and a half or seven, three, <laughs> third. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, but it's important to have you have somebody to, to organize the, the songs too. If you come up with great riffs, but if you don't organize them in a proper way, it doesn't matter, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, but that's a good thing between. I mean, there's a, there's a really good chemistry between me and Paul. You know, he for some weird reason he knows exactly what I'm going to do on on on, on, a, on a certain riff. <laughs> okay, this 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 is perfect for Martin. You know, can't wait what he's going to do with it. And yeah, the other way around, it works like that as well. And that that was the first time that, how it worked on Death the Brute Away. And and there was Bob still in the band. And if Bob would not agree on things, yeah, well, it's simple that he just walks out of the practice room and goes, okay, this is shit, you know? But yeah, see- I think Bob is, Bob is very opinionated on stuff, you know? Exactly. Which, which exactly. It's good, though. It's good that he has a high standard, you know? Exactly. But, you know, I saw him laughing, uh, you know, behind the drum kit, like having a good time, and, and, and Paul was playing so fucking loud, you know, like same as Eric does, is that we had, sometimes we had just people walking out of the practice room, like they just can't take it. You know? so, that, that's another thing with us, you know, we like to have loud volume. <laughs> and Paul liked that as well. So, yeah, I, I remember the, the, the vibe was just really, really good. And, uh, uh yeah, it's every every song I still love every song on that album too. Really, yeah, yeah fantastic. Yeah, effort. I think it's a it's a great album. I mean, I love I love the um, you know first few especially because they you know I've been listening to them forever and stuff. But I definitely think that the brutal way is is one of the pinnacles of your career for sure. You know, at least sure. you know, at least in my opinion, you know. But um, what was it? I, I was wondering as far as just like. How did you you get together with Asphyx in the first place? Um, you know, how did that all kind of come together? I mean, I guess you probably know, knew the guys from the scene and stuff back then. Yeah, but it's like I said, you know, the 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 the, the, the parties on offered Bob all the time. Yeah, to play no. Well, Asphyx. I was talking about before that, like or, like ah. originally, originally, what got in the band? Because I thought that was very interesting. Because I mean, I you knew mean, about mean, the band beforehand, so I was really surprised when you first joined them. I was like, oh shit. Like, that's ah, awesome. Ah, like that, you mean? Yeah, like, okay, in, there. what was it, 91 uh, or 92? I can't remember. Somewhere around that, right? Yeah, because the, the, the consuming was, uh, the tour in America was 1990 with Pestilence. Oh, and okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah, there, there the split kind of happened. And then after, yeah, I think it was two weeks at home after that tour, and I joined Asterix already. Because the fun part was that Bob and me, um, we were training tapes. Okay. And, and then there was here like a punk squatted uh, uh, little house here where a lot of punks were there. But I like to hang there around too as a metalhead. Yeah. But also, also because the beers were really cheap. And it was not far away from the school where Bob was on. So we, after his school, then we met up there at the square. And he came with all kinds of new stuff like, um, you know, hey, Martin, you got to listen to this. I remember, I, I'm sure it was Revenant was on one of these tapes. You know, <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. Awesome. So, 
Yeah, absolutely. So, because, so, so he delivered me also with a lot of stuff and, you know, he was just interested in, in you know, stuff that I had and I had a couple of friends who could deliver other, other stuff. I, well, it was just for trading. Yeah. And then he started yeah. all of a sudden that he was also playing in the band called Aspic. So he gave me, you know, the Enter the Domain um, demo, some first rehearsals. And uh, when I returned from, um, from America, and I have no idea how he heard it or from who, but... Um, uh, so yeah, we had the verbal pestilence fight where I walked out of the practice room and said, "Okay, fuck you and everybody else." So <laughs> I'm out. And then pff, I was—I I remember I was hardly home. And then the, the phone rang. Hey, it's Bob here. <laughs> <Go on. laughs> how about? Um, I know it's a bit of an odd question, you know, and it's all fast and all that. But how about you want to check us out in, in the practice room? Well, yeah, sure, you know. And then I walked in, and it was just Eric's guitar. He blew me away. Like Jesus Christ, these guys do play loud. Because sometimes. <laughs> But sometimes when I was practicing with pestilence, I said to the guys, can you just put it louder? You know, because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we then we can't hear the wrist anymore. So I don't care. You know, I just want noise. <laughs> so, yeah, so I was like, this, this is cool. And then we did a couple of tryouts with with, uh, with Asterix. And I thought the atmosphere was good. And they, 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 they knew their metal. And I was okay. Let's, let's, let's do it. And that's, that's, that's really a short, that's really in, in a nutshell the story. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. And I for, I forget, were they already working with Century Media back then, or was it after uh, you guys? Because I know you guys did some like rehearse, not oh no, like kind of demo stuff or something. Did it? Because weren't you on that? Like, did they do some compilation album? Um, down, Eyes of Death. Eyes of Death? Yeah, wasn't there something? Were, were you guys on it? I can't remember. I remember like Grave and a bunch of the early yeah. bands were on it. I, I think you guys were on it, but I really didn't do my homework to double check. I haven't listened oh, to that no, album no, no. forever. No, no, it, it was a, it was a, it was a, in the eyes of death. But I think that compilation came out uh, after the wreck was on the market as well, because okay. that was a Century Media kind of a way of of letting people introduce people to the, the bands on Century Media. Yeah, uh, and with a cheap, um, with a cheap sampler. You know, uh, I think it was Grave and, and us, and maybe more. Yeah, Unleashed was on there, I think. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's, I had a lot of really great stuff, and I remember even some of it was like. Like kind of like almost good quality demo material, a couple of bands or something. I can't. I, I haven't listened to it forever. Maybe I'm wrong, but no, no. I mean, not from ours. It was just the album versions. Oh, it wasn't just the album versions. Okay. But what we what we what we did for Century Media, and also because we wanted the uh, Asterix actually already recorded Embrace the Death album, but for some weird reason, everything went wrong with the label. And the tape got lost, and I don't know what all happened. Really, really oh, that's bad. right, I remember. <laughs> really bad, and so wow. because of because of all that, we because Harry, when we were practicing in his in his in his in his Harrow studio, he was slowly building up a you know a little studio. We said, you know what, why not try this out? And we make it like a kind of a promo demo. And Harry says, okay, you know, you can just record here. So we did these three tracks that later were different versions than than on the rack later on, but. So, you know, we hardly had to pay anything for it. And we said, okay, now, now we can hear what, he, what Harry's up to with his stuff. And he can, yeah. maybe we can record the album over here, you know, close to our homes. We'll be comfortable and everything. And we can also send it to Century Media and say, because they were already interested yeah. in Asterix. But for them, it was some kind of a bonus that I joined because Pestilence at that time yeah. was getting bigger and bigger, you know. So yeah, they, it was they, a that, big deal. They had, so they had like a kind of a name they could, you know, uh, yeah, advertise a little bit on. You know. Yes, of course, so it makes total sense. Exactly. So that's 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 what happened, and then uh, yeah, we made that we made that uh, demo tape, send it to them. And, uh, they said cool, and then we did the rack, and I think we recorded that one in three days, including the mix. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's fucking awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, sometimes it works out that way, though. Sometimes you just go, you know go do it quick and go with the vibe and it comes out great you know that's a, yeah. a lot of those great old albums you know just you know the, the way it was done the vibe is just uh great because it was just done no bullshit you know no taking forever and stuff because these days with the way recording is you know you can work on an album for freaking ever you know back then it was like, get in the studio you have limited budget let's get this fucker done you know exactly and i wanted i wanted to to I always wanted to make like a kind of a live album, you know, I just played it, plug that shit in and play it live. And actually all the instruments are played it together. You know, we were in the standing in the same room yeah. and played, played the rack and played the songs. And of course you could not sing over it because of the noise. Yeah. So all, the only thing that came after were my vocals, but the rest is all played in really live. Oh, that's, awesome. why, that's, 
that's why three days you know? yeah well it does sound it does have a does have a very i guess a live sound i never really thought about it because I, I never you know I, I didn't know about the story but yeah i listen you know thinking back to the way it sounds it does have a live sound to the album actually you mm. know which is really cool uh, I do remember that because uh, Harry was like, fuck it, I can't do this because Bob's drums microphones, they pick up all the Eric's noise. So you had to kind of build a wooden wall to put that in between, like quickly make yeah. that thing, you know, some wooden plates and put that between Bob and, and, and Eric's amp. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Now I don't have the feedback that much anymore. You know? <laughs> but it was because it, it was his first time like recording a band as well, you know. So it was good fun. <laughs> yeah. That's totally awesome. Hell yeah. Oh, another um, thing I was curious about too is your um I guess you had kind of a short stint in Bolt for over. I mean that that must have been pretty pretty badass to do that. Must have been a lot of fun. Oh yeah, definitely. Not only fun, but a big <laughs> honor as well. <laughs> Yeah, I mean one of the one of the great bands, obviously, uh, in you know death metal history. But you know, just just um, I know they have a really tight camp and they have a really distinctive way of doing things as a band. You know, so I mean, was was it, it a, you know? I mean, I, I figure it was an easy transition, but I was just curious, like how was it to you know go into something that was already established in kind of their own way? You know. Yeah, well, no, I mean, if I was I was just honored, you know, to, to be asked. And I had no idea what was going on inside the camp. And uh, it was not really my business as well, you know. I was yeah, just of player. course. But the reason why they asked me is that they were figuring out who and, and, and you know, who, and because they knew me from the touring. Yeah, that's so right. They knew, they, knew, they knew what kind of type of guy I was. They knew I was, was, was able to do things live uh, and that I was a professional. So they yeah. said, okay, you know, Martin. And then I said, yes. And I remember when they said, they said to me, okay, like, give me some kind of set list. And then I go, well, um, uh, the four albums after uh, Battle, There's No Law. I go, are you kidding me? Give me a set list. No, just see the four. I go, fuck you guys. So I do remember that I went, I went two months before the tour started. I went on a bike, also for my condition, to the practice room, which was like every day I biked like, well, let's say like, 15 between 15 and 20 miles <laughs> then I sang then I said I practiced those four bloody albums like two hours of two and a half hours of practice and then I went back and then so then and well, then they wanted to, they, well, they call out songs and you do <laughs> yeah and then, and, then, and, then, and, then, and then finally there was okay Martin can you now um you can you can fly over because they were basically working in um Martin Kearns you know rest yeah. in peace Martin, my brother. Yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah, so. And so they were working him in, and then they flew me in. That's a long story as well, but okay, uh, keep it short. So then I went to the practice room and I said, okay, you know, this is the set, blah, blah, blah. And then I go, okay, I grabbed the mic. And for me, because, you know, with all the lyrics that I, for example, had in, in, in Pestilence, you know, with uh, Echoes of Death and then Out of the Body, the, the, the vocals of Carl Willis were just fucking simple. You know, I go, like, this is, you know, I can do mortified and then you go, yeah. you, go to, you go to the bar have a beer you know and then <laughs> you go back on stage again like, by the lack of conscience you know like that and it's yeah. so it was really easy and then they practiced okay i go next song next song next song next song finished and i just turned around and go and and i just looked astonished you know like their faces were like fucking hell this guy did it you know he just fucking did it without any bloody mistake i go where's the pub <laughs> 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 Yeah. So they were, they were, they, so I pleased them, and and uh, you know, of course, they pleased me because it was fantastic, and uh, yeah, did a tryout, and, uh, and then we did a tour, and it was just amazing. It was amazing. I mean, it was just, it's, it's just, you know, it's a conquest that's already done. You know, when you, with that band, if you go on stage and they play the first, you know, chord of, uh, of the Fourth Crusade, it's, you know, it's already done. Every, you know, <laughs> just to see hands and horns until the back of the end of the venue, it's, you don't have to do anything. <laughs> They go crazy. It's, uh, it was fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it had to have been really awesome. Yes. Yes. It's just, it's just, uh, yeah, you know, like uh, sometimes it's sad a little bit that I don't have, uh, they told me once that Baz is supposed to have some like soundboard tapes at home, but, uh, you know, knowing both of them, they're not going to do anything with it. Also due to respect to, you know, the other vocalists, but uh, yeah. it would be right. cool to hear, to hear myself, you know, on, on these tracks, but, uh, ah, well, you know, it was already, um, it was already a you know wonderful experience to be 
two long tours with him to extend. Yeah, well, well, I remember, um, I, mean, I, I mean, not remember, I was looking for some footage of that. And it's, I, I didn't find any anywhere. Mm. Okay. You know, which I, 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 me I, neither. Me neither. Yeah, it would just be really interesting because, I mean, you know, just being, I, I, I love those kind of things because I love when, you know, I hear bands that I like and, you know, other people that I like are doing a show or doing vocals for, for whatever reason, you know, as a, as a fan of both bands, I guess, you know, I'm a fan of your vocals, I'm a fan of both for So I just wanted to hear it. I thought it'd be kind of cool to, to listen to, but I haven't found nothing with that, which is just really, really bummer, you know? Yeah. That's yeah. kind of a, a part yeah, of but that's, death metal but that's, history. But that was in the days where you had no cell phones or nothing. <laughs> yeah. And they were really, um, um, they were really taking care of, uh, people not getting into the bootleg you know there's yeah. always some there's always someone someone at the door to check for that you know to, to, to not have them bootlegged so there was a uh, yeah there was a tight control on that so yeah, yeah that's, that's that's why and it worked apparently because you can't find anything <laughs> <laughs> yeah but I mean, yeah it's true though i mean there will i mean really both for was probably one of the uh, few bands that actually do a pretty good job of you know stopping a lot of bootleggers from bootlegging their stuff i mean um you know, yeah. I mean, it just seems like they, I mean, there's always going to be some people trying to do it or whatever. You can't ever stop hundred percent, but they actually do a really good job with that. You know, it's in, in general, Bolt Throwers are really, I mean, they're a great band, but they're very interesting because they really kind of do do things in their own way and it works. It just totally works for them. You know, I don't know if other bands can even really do it in the way they do things. For some reason, for them though, they just have it down. Because we did, we did all, only a short tour with them on their on our final tour, yeah. um, and uh, you know, just just by doing a few shows, I really, I really was, um, you know, impressed with the way, you know, they kind of run the show the way they want to, and you know, I don't, know, I really respected that because. You know, most most bands don't really uh, you know give a crap about a lot of stuff, but you can tell they really care about all aspects of the uh, show, the way it's run, the bands that are on, and everything is like you know even they you know both in the venues themselves. I mean, yep. really, uh, really cool operation. I thought. Yeah, it, it, it kind of the thing is that that's how it actually started when with, with, with Pestilence and, um, and and Graham like came together for the first time. Uh, that's how we were rolling, and they just picked it up because he yeah. was going to them later on after the split, you know. Because uh, so, so yeah, that's why they continued from there. And yeah, the Asterix, I mean, we're not working exactly like them, but there's a similarity, you know. We um, like with Buffalo, we try to keep our merchandise prices low, you know, like affordable to everybody. Yeah. Uh, try to live your quality. Try to make sure that you know certain things are. You know, I mean, for us, it's, for example, more important that you have like a good backline and good gear than um, than the quality of the evening food, you know? Yeah. So, and I think that goes a little bit, you know, it's just like a short, short, um, of a small example. But uh, yeah, of, of course, they do that, you know, way more professional than we. I mean, we're, in the end, <laughs> Asterix is a chaos band. And uh, <laughs> you know, but also a little bit as well, too. I mean, in, in the end, they're still punks is what they always say. But uh, yeah, yeah, they're, they're, I mean, their organization is just up to the, you know, to the smallest details. Absolutely. And that's, yeah. that's, that's really cool. That's just admirable. Uh, yeah, a absolutely. And um, I know there was a, a time you kind of weren't too active in the scene or whatnot. I mean, what was your uh, mindset there? You just kind of needed a break from it all or just, um, you know, just uninspired? I mean, what was, what was going on during your kind of... The thing is a little bit that the reason why I... Well, me and, and both of us separate ways. Uh, there's no other expression to say here because I didn't leave and they didn't kick me out. It's not, it, it didn't happen like that. Okay. It was all of a sudden I had a, um, I had some strange hair disease called uh, oh. alopecia areata and my hair was falling out. Oh, and I didn't now, know that. Wow. Yeah, and, and to me as a metal head, um, since yeah. I was a kid, I was growing my hair and I really had to fight, you know, to, for that here in this area to, you yeah. know, because uh, yeah, it was just not accepted. So there was something. Yeah, that was like a kind of a really big part of my metal identity. Oh. And I was I was really struggling with it. I mean, I had no pain. I had, and I was not like you have like a terrible disease or something. It's just that back then I 
I couldn't cope with it. And then like, okay, you know, like a dermatologist told me, yeah, it's just an immune system, uh, immune um, 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 disturbance, and we can put some some hormones in you. I said, no, nah, no, nah, I don't want that stuff. But then both were booked like a, a big show at, I think it was Full Force. And they wanted me, of course, like, uh, yeah, to confirm. I said, no, I can't go on stage like this. Yeah, I say, yeah, Martin, you can, you know, why not wear a bandana? I go, like, oh, fuck off with this, all that shit, you know. I mean, hey, look, I'm suffering, you know, my hair's fucking falling out. I can't go on stage like that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we want, Martin, we want to confirm, you know, you're doing it or no, you're not. So no, then I'm not. Okay, then then you know we step, and then they just then they asked Dave Ingram quickly to step in. Yes. Yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, me then after all these years, you know, pestilence, asphyx, then ball thrower, and then that happened. And I was just completely disappointed. I said, you know what? I call it a day. I just, you know, get myself a good job and <laughs> screw it all. That was just it. You know, yeah. and I just, I mean, I was, I was, I was, I was listening still a bit metal, but not, not so, you know, not in a fanatic way. And, you need, and, you need I, to get away from it for a while. Yes, exactly. Exactly. That, yeah, that, happened, I, that, that, that happened really. So but I know you did some other projects in that time too. Some probably guest vocal appearances and stuff like that. Some smaller things. Yeah, and, and, and the funny part is that that's how I found, um, you know, I mean, the weird thing is that all of a sudden my hair started going back you know, without any reason. And I still just had out of nowhere. Thing. It just happened. Yes, yes. And this is just, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's part of that disease. Some, you can lose any, everything. You can lose all the hairs, even from your eyebrows, you know. <laughs> Those are the worst cases. But, yeah, it's... Uh, it's weird, but it can. In my case, it just came back, and you know, I still have like fortunately still a shitload of long hair now, even grey. But uh, well, that's part of getting old. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> but the thing is that that while I was working and uh, actually enjoyed the job, and there came this this, this strange uh, little Italian uh, uh, as a colleague came in, like fully tattooed, and he looked like some kind of new metal kid, you know. Yeah. And I went with him. We had a good. We had good fun, and then. Uh, I think it was in the summer where, uh, yeah, I was just wearing shirt. But I, I have like this pestilence tattoo, you know, with like a zombie head on top of it. But I never show it, you know. So like, yeah. it's on my shoulder, so my a t-shirt covers it. And then one day I was ke- trying to lift a, 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 bo- a heavy box, and then he saw the tattoo and he goes, "What's that?" I said, "My a tattoo of one of my older bands." And he goes, so he lifts up the shirt and he was like, "What's that? It says pestilence. Is that one of your older bands?" Yeah. So he starts to hug me. Oh, cool. <laughs> Yeah. And then he and then he goes, I have a band. And I go, No, 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 no. And then and then he uh then we yeah, we went to different um, parts of the company. So he was working for somebody else in the same company and I was working on another uh, building. And then but because I was a, a foreman, I had an own phone like for the company carrying with me. And then during my break the, the phone rang and it was this. Hey, it's people. Um, uh, I have a problem. So what problem? He goes, well, I'm in the studio with my band and my singer left. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Can you, can you help me? <laughs> oh, well, all right. Uh, all right. Okay, pick me up afterward. Let's just to see. So I come there. I go, where are the lyrics? Uh, you have no lyrics. <laughs> you have no lyrics. What do you want me to sing then? <laughs> you know, you just just like Tardy. I say, I'm not going to do like Tardy. <laughs> So I wrote, I wrote like on a Sunday afternoon, I think I wrote five songs, like really scrappy, scrappy, <laughs> found some titles for it, sang it in. And then I told him afterwards, never, ever ask me again. <laughs> and, then, and then the same procedure, a couple of months later, the same procedure, phone rang. Um, yeah, uh, you like to do one show with me in Italy? In Italy? Yeah, and there's one tomorrow in Germany, and then we drive to there. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was the most horrible show I've ever done in my life. His his drum kit fell apart <laughs> during the show, and it fell on the yeah. back of my legs. I felt like the bass drum hitting my legs, and then I turned around like, "Well, he's just sitting there." On this <laughs> hey. But the thing was, John, that um, I realized that I missed it, and and uh, um, that I re- even though it was the worst circumstances and like hardly crowds, but I just yeah. missed. The- I just missed the fun of making metal. So I, I joined and then, yeah, I stayed a couple of years with him. And, and Which, which had, band was this one? That, that was Death by Dawn. Okay, yeah. That's what I thought. Uh, we did a record and um, I still think it's cool, but it was a bit of a different thing. You know, it was a sidestep from the death metal. Uh, but still it was brutal. You know, it was yeah. not this 
to say, oh, I, uh, I regret doing this. No, not at all. I wrote some punk lyrics with it, some social critical lyrics, which I always yeah. wanted to do. And uh, yeah, it was a mix up of all kinds of things, but we really had good fun. And we played in the shittiest venues, you know, like for crowds of 40 or 50 people. And that's why I appreciate so much nowadays, you know, that you have like beer, because it hasn't been a long, it's not so long ago, you know, that I've really been down, you know, with them in, in um, yeah, in, in, in terrible conditions. And, and now you, you just appreciate everything that people do for you. But it was a good time. And that's why, yeah, that, that got me back into it because I just, I just enjoy myself, you know. After a week of hard labor, you just went to the guys and you either played a show somewhere or you locked yourselves into a rehearsal with sex crates of beers and, uh, you know, having a good time the whole weekend. It was that's, a hit, that, you know? that's good, though. I mean, because you kind of you kind of came back to it, uh, you know, more just for the fun of it to do. And it wasn't it wasn't like uh, you got the huge big offer to get back into it. You know, you kind of realized, oh, OK, I'm kind of having a good time doing this again. And, you know that I mean, in essence, that's really the most important thing when playing music. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, I understand money is important and all this other stuff, but, you know, you, the reason why all of us started playing music is because it was fun. It was something exactly. we wanted to do to express ourselves. So, I mean, that story is actually, um, you know, inspirational. And also it's it's a good it's a good way to kind of, you know, yeah, now that you're uh, in a very successful situation with Aspects, it's not too far away. You, you went from you know, things going great, the things going, you know, not so great for a little while. I mean, to not doing it at all, the things, you know, just doing it for the fun of it and then back to doing great. And, you know, as long as, yeah, I mean, some people are assholes and never going to appreciate it, you know, but, you know, I think most people, when you go through that, you know, ups and downs, you, when things do go well, you're just like, this is pretty fucking cool, you know, and, you know, mm -hmm. you do, you know, you have, you're actually enjoying the fact you know, because you're playing music because you enjoy it, but you're also, the success is also, of course, it's very uh, appreciative, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, the, the thing with success is that it's, it's, it's a nice um, thing what comes along with it. But the main thing, just like you said, you know, the main thing is that you go, I go on stage or I make albums because I like to do that. Because the love of the metal that I listen to, that I make myself, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's passion, you know? It's it's all about the passion, and um, if you don't have that, then uh, yeah, it's, it's it's better. Like I said before, you know, then it's better to do something else. And and apart from that, um, that whole process, you know, back then, it, for me, it worked healing. You know, it really worked healing because I was, uh, yeah, I went quite deep. You know, I I do remember I wrote a song with Death by Dawn, which is called "Divorce Convicted Fire." Then because th those were three things that happened to me, like in a short period of time. Yeah. So I was re I was really like, you know, um, down really was yeah. not, not in not, not in a way of that i was depressed but yeah i was yeah it was one of the lowest um um yeah parts of my life really yeah one of, of those parts and so that with those boys and having fun again yeah you know they just helped me through also you know so it's not just um it's not just the fact that uh yeah that i do it for passion but also for me it works healing and and uh, not just like that, but it's, it's, it's simple. You know, you, you may be not feeling, you, you may feel terrible or your back hurts or your whatever it is. But if you, if it's time to hit that stage, it's like the adrenaline just blows away everything yes. on pain that's in your body. And you go, okay, I can hang on. And, you know, I can hang on for one or one and a half hours. <laughs> and, and later I suffer double, but that just, that little, that just, that, that yes. you know, that little part of time is like, okay, you know, here it's, it's pain free for a moment and later on we'll see, you know, so it's, it's more than, uh, than, yeah, yeah it's, 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 more, it's, it's more than just for the, for the love of the music. This is really more, more to it for me, that is, you know, yeah. but if I would have, they could, they could give me a shit. I mean, thing is, for example, there's, of course, I've been a lot of offers for, for example, for pestilence for me to join. Yes, I'm but, sure. But, but I, for me, I will not because I, I'm not doing it for the money only. I, I need to have a good time with the band that I go on stage. And I'm just sure if I go with them on stage, I will not have a good time. It's me yeah. and other guys do something. Uh, yeah, sorry, I don't want that. You know? Yeah, it's, 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 yeah. If we go on stage, you can see 
you know, that's what we that's what we kind of beam out, you know, to the people that you can see that we're having a good time, that we're having fun, that we're that we're, that we're, that we're enjoying ourselves. We're making jokes all the time. We freak out. You know, it's just, it's just a pleasure, you know, to be with these boys on stage. Yeah. Well, so it's uh, only the money, you know. Yeah. Well, what I was curious about: Did you actually get an, an offer from Pat to to work with Pestilence again? No, it was not Pat. It was other people. Like I was going to say, cause that would be. I just couldn't imagine Pat. Well, I, to do I don't know Pat well, well but I, I don't know. He, he actually he actually did mail me. It was a weird kind of mail. I'm not gonna, you know, like uh, tell all the content of it, but it was a weird one. Yeah. Um, but anyway, it was a. I think you know that festival. It's a Stonehenge in the yes. Netherlands. Yeah, of yeah, course. Pretty yeah. Pretty cool. And uh, so we were playing there with Asterix, and Pestilence was playing there as well. And then I think it was two days before uh, where he. Dropped a mail. I have no idea who gave him uh, my my mail address anyway. Yeah, uh, probably his manager because that guy wrote me once too, uh, okay. without without getting answer from me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, no, I just didn't uh, didn't answer at all. I think it was the best way to to react. But uh, so so basically, so, you, you've so, been... so Pat, Patrick. Okay. Sorry. So, so Patrick asked me then to perform on Stonehenge with them out of the body. Oh. But uh, since Thanatos was playing there as well and Asterix, and then Pestilence. And I promised Thanatos, because Paul uh, is also in Thanatos yes. still, and Stefan Gebedi is also in Thanatos. So they were the two guitarists of, of Halo Bullets. So yes. we decided months before, Gebedi already asked me, like, Martin, how about doing Order Eastward, you know, together with Thanatos? So yeah, sure, you know, because I like the guys. Yeah. And then, so Patrick comes with Out of the Body, and then two days before, not that it would be a problem for me not to do it, but I go, yeah, well, and then, there were a couple of other things in that mail. I go, okay, I'm not going to react anyway. I'm not going to respond to this. Yeah. But then I would, I would even not have done that because, yeah, you know, you do the things with the with with the the Halo Bullet song with Thanatos. You do your Asterix song, songs, tracks, uh, show. Sorry. And then the best, what is it? Is it Stonehenge or is it the Van Drunen Festival? Come on. You know? <laughs> yeah. It was, just a, it was just one of these weird mails again. Where I go, oh, come on, can't you just, yeah, you know, get. So it's basically more of a management thing. It doesn't matter. I mean, let's let's face it. I mean, management would look at it like, of course, it's a great thing for Pestilence. And and to be fair, a lot of fans would love to see it. But I do agree with you that you know, if your heart's not into it, it's better not to not to do it. You know, it's not, like should just do it for the for the money of it, or uh, you know, have it be insincere. I think if people really if it ever if it ever was to happen, which I, I know it won't, but it should happen for the right reasons and not just because it's a money grab or something like that or a publicity you know, you thing. Know, you know, it's a weird one, and people there's hardly people knowing this, but me and Pat got together in two thousand. Oh, okay. Talks. Yeah, we met. We went out a couple of times, having a couple of drinks, and then there was a talk about um, doing something not only the moniker of Pestilence, but then Pestilence two thousand. I see. So, so I said to him, like, you know what? We can start off a little bit and, you know, do some shows and, and play some all of the material. And then he goes and says to me, like, literally, he goes, uh, I'm not going to play the old material. I said, well, then, there's no, then, then this discussion is over. This is ridiculous. Oh. I said, we're not going to go on stage <laughs> and play all these songs without playing anything of Consuming Impulse or Malaya's Maleficarum. This, I said, that's ridiculous. People are going to lynch us, man. No, I don't want it. <laughs> okay, then, then, then we're done talking. And then a couple of days later, because I knew his address, he didn't pick up his phone. Uh, he didn't mail me back because I just wanted to, you know, maybe have another try, whatever. Yeah. You know? And then I, I wrote a letter and I shoved it under the door uh, of where he lived and I never got an answer. And then yeah. later on, I read that he reformed the, the band again. But yeah, that was already back in Asterix and in, uh, with Hill of Bullets. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. weird. weird. Well, That's, people don't know that. You know, it was a weird one. Well, I think what... Um... What what happens sometimes, and it's difficult because people that are just fans of the band, they, they don't understand the dynamics of what goes on behind the scenes, you know. And sometimes, no matter how much you even try to work things out, like, you know, band personalities don't always work out, you know. It's like, mm -hmm. you could, you know, you could want to do something as much as, you know, I mean, you can want to do something, but with somebody, but if that person that you're working with either doesn't want to do it with you, or you you haven't resolved the problems, or you just that person, you know, sometimes it just doesn't work out. Regardless of, you know, you you can try all you want to make the relationship happen or make the band happen, but if both sides aren't, 
you know, feeling it or, you know, I mean, there's like a trillion reasons why these things don't work out. I think sometimes fans, you know, they just know, they, they just know they like consuming impulse. So they're going to be like, we just want to see, you know, for, you know, and it, it might be the fans being selfish in a way because they, they don't understand, like the people in the band also have to, you know, have, obviously have a say in it. They want to be happy. We don't want to go up there on stage and just be robots to do what other people want us to do just to please them. I mean, it's, it's so much better that you're playing in a band like Asphyx where you're enjoying it, having fun with the guys, than if you're miserable on tour, just <laughs> doing it just because somebody, you know, you have a, you know, a bunch of fans want, you know, I want to see, you know, you know, consuming impulse or, you know, out of body or whatever play live, you know? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That, that's, that's how I see it. That's why I, you know, for me, um, yeah, there was no, uh, uh, you know, others took the initiative. And then for me, there was no point in saying, okay, I'm going to do it because I knew the situation. Would, and then I would still, even if that would, ha even if that would happen, then I would have Patrick calling me or said, okay, let's, let's meet. Uh, meet up and talk this out if you want and then we can see how much we eventually change throughout the years or if we can get together again you know yeah but not but not uh with in the medians like record labels or management yes yeah, it has to be personal exactly exactly and then like i said and then and then personally you can see okay uh, is this going to work you know is so this person so you so you can see what kind that that's you know that's so ex uh, you know the best example is with paul you know and asterix because i knew paul because uh, uh, we were starting up like Hill of Bullets, and I knew he was um, yeah, a very dedicated guy, a very nice guy. Uh, he's mm -hmm. one of the nicest guys you can you, you know you can meet. And, and I agree. So so you knew that you had you had somebody, you had a really good person, also with his metal heart in the right place. So you knew you can, can you, you know there was a future with him. But yeah, if if you had the feeling that with somebody else is not going to work, well, there's no point in even starting it. You know, it's like. You know, it's almost like, uh, oh, here's, here's, a, um, here's, a, here's a fantastic, wonderful looking woman. She looks bloody hot, but her character is a shit. But still, we're going to get married. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. You know? Yeah, you get, exactly. You get, you, get, you get laid like for three good nights, and then I'll put trouble starts. No. Yeah. No. And that's funny. I mean, that, I mean, I know from my personal experience that's happened. You know, numerous times when I've tried to work with, uh, you know, some former members, it's a, it, you know, it's it's a bummer because you you're optimistic and you want things to work out, but no matter what, I mean, ninety percent of the time, it does seem like the old issues just end up, you know, like the cracks form and the old issues end up coming back, and it just it just becomes unfun anymore. Like even sometimes, like. You know, you, the idea of doing it, it gets romanticized early on, you know, but then at a certain point, you know, after you're doing it, you realize like, yeah, we really, you know, there was a reason why this didn't work out for the long yeah. term in the first place, you know, and, you know, I mean, it's not impossible. And I mean, you know, it's different maybe when you're, if you're playing in a band like Black Sabbath or Rolling Stones or something, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, you never have to see anybody and just go on stage mm -hmm. and play and collect millions of dollars. Okay, that's one thing. But, <laughs> you know, a, a band like, we'll say like Pestilence is that, you know, you're going to be around each other all the time. And if, <laughs> you know, you just can't get along, it's not going to be fun. And it's not going to be fun for either of I mean, it's, it's bad for Pat and for you, you know, and anybody yeah. else in the band. It's like a bunch of miserable fucks, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, and 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 then yeah, like you say, you know, you just, you know, as you as you skids like the situation, there's there will be, it will be me and him, but the other two, who who are they going to be? You know, first of all, first of all, they have to deal with with my melody, then they have to deal with me. Yeah. Okay, I'm I'm, I'm 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 really easy to deal with, but they will probably wonder themselves like, okay, who are we in this? You know? Yeah, and well, then, it starts to turn into allegiances, you know, <laughs> and like you know. It gets crazy. It's stupid. It's yeah, exactly. It's not. It's not. A, it's not a yeah, an optimal uh, situation to be in a band with. You know, you, then you might as well call it like some kind of project. Yeah, but it would be retarded to um, to see a version of uh, Pestilence with you in the band and then play nothing off of the first two albums. Would just be like, yeah, I would just be like, uh. <laughs> Okay, cool. You know, I mean, even if the new songs were great, I'd be like, you know, these, these, you know, early songs are part of my like, you know, childhood or, you know, 
um, DNA of like death metal that I enjoy be like retarded to not play some of the fans most popular material, you know? Yeah, I mean, anyways, come on. <laughs> you know, I mean, even, even if you want to go, if you go to a live show with Black Sabbath, you know, you, no matter how many times you heard the song, but you still want to hear Paranoid. Come on. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. It's just, it's bullshit. You're not going to go and see like one of your old, bear, your old favorites and they're not going to play anything of the, of the, you know, of the old material. It's, yeah. It's like, what the hell is this shit? I mean, I think I, I think someone told me that once they went to an Iron Maiden show or something. I don't know which album that was. Yes. One of the recent ones. Yeah. It was... And and I think they decided to play only that album and nothing. And I go what? And yeah, they, they... and the people I talked to were really disappointed because they didn't play any old stuff. Yeah, nothing. I think. It was, I go, uh, yeah, I heard about it. it's a Dance of Death album. They did. I think I, I don't know how, what. I guess it did well in Europe and the U.S. It got to like number one or something. So they're like as as a gift, we're going to play this whole album live. And then he played the whole album, and I, I wasn't there, but our bass player Chuck was there, and he told me, you know, all they, they played that whole album, and then they just played the song Iron Maiden at the end, and Chuck, Chuck was <laughs> Chuck was like so bummed out, <laughs> like the whole crowd is just like, what the hell is going on here? You know, I mean, I mean, with with such an amazing <laughs> catalog of material, it's like I understand you want to play some new stuff, but you got to sprinkle in some of the classics. I mean, come on. I mean, Iron Maiden. I mean, how do you, you not do some of those songs? You know, I mean, <laughs> I mean, you could they could have picked any they could have picked any song to you know throw in there from the first like four albums, five albums, and you know the, the sprinkle in there, and it would have been it would have made it the amazing show instead it was just like you know it was like almost like but you know i know they do they the iron maiden kind of makes up for they say because they'll come back and they'll do like a, a full set of the classics or whatever and i, I get it that you want to play the new stuff but you still you gotta mix um you gotta mix the new and the old stuff together i mean it's just um it's setless 101 <laughs> you know yeah if I would be Paul Diano, I would be smarter. And that's straight after that show of uh, Iron Maiden with Dance of Death, I would say Paul Diano plays uh, Iron Maiden and just the killers and the Iron Maiden album. And for the yeah. first time in, in decades, the man will have like packed venues. Yeah, I know. That would be amazing. <laughs> I know, I know. I love, trust me, I love Paul Diano. That, we just actually on the show did a, 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 a you would call it a tribute to the killers album just kind of like a it was kind of like a debate show but you know sometimes on our our show we just pick like an album that we like a lot and we have like a bunch of people join us and we just kind of talk about you know how much the album means to us and all this kind of stuff it's, it's really a lot of fun and um yeah we did the killers album and that it just that is such a good album. I mean, that's really, I mean, that's my favorite Iron Maiden album. I mean, same here, same here. I have I, my two, my two favorites. Um, I have the Paul Diana one is Killers, and then the, the Bruce Dickens for me is Peace of Mind. Those two albums are just, uh, to me, my two favorites of both, um, both vocalists. But Paul Diana, I mean, that Killers album is just such a, um, ah, such a, such an amazing album. So much atmosphere, dark. The exactly. production's perfect. You know, yeah. it's great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I remember I bought that one. Yeah, yeah, straight bought it blind. <laughs> you didn't see that cover. You knew that it was going to be <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, um, I, was, I was a big Maiden fan back then. I mean, I, I bought the first album also like blind, just you know, when it was yeah. out. I had it. I still have that one. You know. Yeah. yeah. And the same with the Killers. So I saw them as well the first, and and also the first uh, with the Beast with, the, with the Bruce. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, there was a, because I, yeah, there was somebody here like in the area and, uh, you know, I was delivering newspapers, so I had a little bit of extra money and there was someone here organizing like, a, you know, a bus yeah. and then uh, you had to pay like 25 guilders, which was like, yeah. back then, let's say like 10 bucks for yeah. the entrance of the show and 10 bucks for the bus. So it was like 20, let's say 20, 25 bucks for me. Yeah. And then the show was like Scorpions uh, with the Blackout album. Oh wow! Uh, I was made in with Number of the Beast, and then um, Blackfoot with Marauder, and I still <laughs> like Blackfoot a lot, you know. Yeah, but it was yeah. fucking awesome. It was really cool. It was really cool. Yeah, that's that's an awesome, awesome time to see Iron Maiden. Yeah, I, I, they they toured here, but I was just too young at the time to go see them uh, when they. I the first time I I got to see them was on uh, Power Slave. I wish I would have seen them earlier, but I just just wasn't old enough to 
go to any of the places that they were at. I mean, okay. I lived outside of New York, but my mom wasn't going to let me go to like Madison Square Garden or um, ah, I don't like know. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't going to happen. Know. <laughs> it wasn't That's until right. I was old enough to say, well, I'm going if you like it or not. You know? <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a different thing, you know, if you go to New York or if you go to Amsterdam, like, it's a different city. Not that. <laughs> No, I mean Amsterdam. Yeah, like still considered the city a sin, you know. So yeah, but my my parents didn't know I was doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there was a certain point when I I had the same thing too. I would just go. I I actually, you know, I got to the point where I told my mom like I can either tell you that I'm going there and you let me go, or I tell you I'm doing something else and I'm going. So you can make the choice, you know. Because I remember I used to for like going to Lemoore's and stuff back in the day, you know. That is a lot of shit playing there too, huh? Yeah that, yeah, that was an amazing, amazing venue in uh, Brooklyn, uh -huh. a part of New York. It was, um, it, it was, it was a pain in the ass because I mean, people get their cars broken into all the time outside. But I remember that's where I've seen a lot of the great uh, bands like Carnivore early on. Um, you know, uh, Whiplash and um, yeah. early, you know, early Nuclear Assault and um, what was it? You see, that was like the creator, um, the creator uh, Voivod show was there. Yeah. That was that was an amazing one. Just just so many. You can see um, Slayer play there. It was right when, um, what's his name? Um, Dave Lombardo came back after they had the Joey Scaglione. Like, we didn't know Joey Scaglione was out of the band. So they just started with uh, Rain and Blood. And like when they did the, did, 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 you know, um, we would yeah. call it. Um, the drummer, I can't, what's it? Uh, I just said his name. Uh, Dave Lombardo just oh, kind of like he just stood up on the stage, you know, and everybody was like freaking out. It was a really killer, it was a fun, fun show. That, that was a great, a great venue. We were very fortunate to have that because it was kind of like the, the place that every band that came to the U.S. played. I, if I was a little older, I would have been able to see some of the classics there, like, you know, Metallica and stuff like that. But I just was a little bit too, uh, you know, I was just a little too young to get out. My, my mom, you know, my mom wasn't going to be like, yeah, you can go to Brooklyn at 13 or 14 years old. Like, yeah. No way, you know, and I didn't know. We don't have the public transportation as good as you have in Amsterdam, in, I mean, in uh, Netherlands. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, was, you know, we had, we had it, but it just isn't the same, you know. It's not as easy to get around like that, yeah. you know. But anyway. I just understand man i mean come on as parents you're not gonna it's, it's, it's different if you send your you send your kid at 30 years old into you know into brooklyn <laughs> you know then they might let it go here to Enschede and then you know to the venue i used to go to the attack one i mean it was just it wasn't a center you know yes and there were maybe here and there a couple of bummers and some junkies but it wasn't so bad you know i mean they were not they yeah. were not harassing but still even 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 then we always we always were with a bunch of kids, you know. So if we could thrash somebody up, it was, it was <laughs> yeah. Us, so yeah, yeah. yeah. Was, I, I, we were we were going on our bicycles always every night because it was the, the the latest bus back home. You know, it was too late to finish the concert, so we ended up on our bikes and we had to you know bike yeah. what nine miles or something completely. <laughs> well, <drunk. laughs> it was really funny because the first time I played in Holland, I was just like. Holy crap! What the fucks with all these fucking bicycles? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it blew my mind. I'm like, I'm like, because I'd be like, you know, there'd be people coming with their, you know, um, you know, war vests on, you know, with like, uh, I don't know, mayhem or something on back of their jackets, riding a freaking bicycle, you know. And I'm just like, dude. You get your ass beat in the U.S. if you rode your bicycle to the show, you know. But it was just funny because, like, the show was packed, and you know, it was a huge bicycle, um, you know, little, little place where you park them or whatever, you know, bicycle racks and stuff. And I just thought it was a big trip. It was just weird the first time because being from New Jersey, New York area, you just never <laughs> yeah. see it. You know? <laughs> yeah, but it has also to do with the fact that you know, I mean, uh, there's there's good. Um, I mean, it's safe here to go with your bicycle on the street. Yeah. And yeah. the accident are protected. No matter, even if you cause the accident, still the car driver will be uh, will be the one who's guilty and has to pay. It's like yeah. something like that. And it, it, it's, yeah, we, used to, we get used to it, you know. We 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 yeah. yeah, we are biking when we are like what? I don't even know. We 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 bike before we can walk. I don't know. So it's, <laughs> yeah. we 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 can do anything on these things. I, you know, I can still like get crates of beer on my on my bike. <laughs> 
you know, <laughs> drive from the supermarket home with a whole crate of beer. And then I got two other full bags hanging on the steering wheel. You know I mean? Yeah. It's, it's just, it, you just grew up with it. And it, especially go to concerts. Um, yeah. For kids. Um, mo- most of the time, I mean, yes, in, in big cities as Amsterdam or Rotterdam and, and in the West of the Netherlands, that's actually the part of that's called Holland. They do have very good public transport in, that, that also goes in the night. But if you go here or um, let's say southern part like Tilburg or uh, Eindhoven or uh, Groningen, they won't have night transport. So you will yeah. always miss the end of the show. So that's why kids decide, okay, let's go with the bike. And, you know, we're used to it. For them, it's like, you know, a couple of kilometers extra uh, with bike and then, oh, well, with a, with a bunch of beers, it doesn't really matter. You know, you're okay. Uh, yeah. At least I'm going to see the show. It's, well, it's yeah. easy, but it's, I, I can imagine it's really weird for people to come and then all of a sudden, you like, yeah, there's this guy with a satiric on the backpack you know, <laughs> with, with corpse paint on the bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it makes total sense because, I mean, I know sometimes, I, yeah, like I remember like Tilburg, sometimes you play play there or some people leave early because of the public transportation and stuff you know so it makes total sense why why you do it but it just, it just was i just remember it being culture shock it was one of those you know because it's you know it's probably the same thing when you first came to america for the first oh, time yeah. it's like you know it's the same but it's different <laughs> you know well, I mean, and I remember, remember i told you my first entrance to america <laughs> was like in detroit in long beach and i was like wow we are we are in America, yeah. What a fantastic country! <laughs> I remember right at, across the street in Blondies, they had a. I think they had a. Uh, I don't know if it was a pizza place or some kind of fast food place, and like some kind of uh, convenience store, and it had like that bulletproof glass. <laughs> You know, where they, where they put the stuff in and they turn it around and give it to you. You put the money, you know, it's like, it was just really, <laughs> and I could just imagine the first time coming to the U.S. It's like, you might be thinking you're going to, into a jail or yeah, something. And I, and I, think, and I, think, I think it was there I stand outside. And that's the, all of the, the, the sky was pretty pitch black in no time of, what the fuck? Look at that sky, man. Then someone comes up to me, man, you better get inside and hide for cover. Find me a bloody tornado. I go, what? <laughs> yeah, I know. It's crazy. Oh, yeah. I never forget that. And, and there was there was a backstage, Was uh, I think it was as, as big as one table, like the whole room, and there was a couch, and so it was two people could sit on it. That was it. You know, like, well, great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know it, 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 yeah totally had to be culture shock you know i mean that that i couldn't imagine going to you know because you probably hear about how like nice the usa is you know and all the stuff and you, you go to like one of the most rundown cities at that time <laughs> ever you know? Yeah, I know. <laughs> like you're like wow freedom sucks <laughs> it's like it's like you're going into a jail you know <laughs> There was because you know, because when they when they drove us there, you had like um yeah you you drove through neighborhoods, and they had like the windows were out and they were like yeah. closed you know with like wooden plates. Yeah. And like Jesus Christ, this is like a fucking ghetto, man. Yeah, it's a real deal. <laughs> yeah. We don't have that. We don't have that over here. You know, we don't have. Uh, yeah, in the Netherlands, yes, there, there may be a couple of bad neighborhoods, but come on, they're not like. You know, yeah. the ghettos that you have over in the U.S. or something. And wow. So for us, yeah, that was like a culture shock. Like, what the Yeah, hell? especially back at that time, it's like that was right after, like, I think a lot of the, uh, you know, car businesses started, mm-hmm. like, going under and stuff. And it was it was just – that was at its worst as far as, like, a failed city. I mean, I, I don't know the whole situation about, um, you know, Detroit, but I know that, that was, like – at probably the pinnacle of its worst time yeah. um, in history there. I mean, it was it was just terrible. I mean, we, we played a couple of places there too, and people were getting held up outside the venue, um, and there was cars getting broken into and stuff. It was a, I think it was a place called uh, Blondie's. I can't, no, it wasn't, no, Blondie's was a place you played. This was another place, uh, I forget, but they had the, the metal fest there, the uh, Michigan metal fest. Uh, uh, Todd, it was at it was at Todd's. No, it was at Todd's. It was in Detroit, and 
I mean, the venue was a great venue, but it was just it was just in a bad neighborhood. It was just a lot of crime and stuff, and people's cars were getting broken into. It was just a total disaster um, because of that. But uh, it's really it's really a sad uh, it's really a sad thing, um, you know. Because actually, the scene in in Michigan is actually really good. But for a while, just the venues were just. I mean, that's kind of the problem sometimes touring the states is that. You know, you're playing. You get like a a tour of all the worst neighborhoods in the states because that's like where they could have, afford to have a venue. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, so, yeah that's how it is. So that, that that's the difference. With the the big difference with over. You know, in especially, let's say, let's say like especially like more northern Europe. You know. Yeah. Because because because. Yeah, if, uh, for example, my girlfriend she lives in Paris, and and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a big city. But the problem there is venues because mm -hmm. the promoter has to pay. Yeah. A lot for a good venue. Uh, I think I saw you guys uh, at uh, at the club there. Yeah, and that is, I mean, it's really small, you know, and it's yeah. really like in a, in that basement. But at least you can play there. Uh, the venue is not costing a lot for the promoter. But if you would go to one of the most more beautiful venues like the Van du Monde or something, yeah, you know, the promoter has to pay a shitload just for that, you know. And then you yeah. really, have to, and then you really have to sell out. But then. You get that. That's a, I think I was with Lisa, and she wanted to see some band that she liked, like some doom band from Finland. I don't know. So I went with her, and then later we had a quick drink with these guys. But then the venue is closing and kicks the bands out really fast because after that it's like yes. a club thing, you know. But I was at Gibbous. They do that all the time at Gibbous. Oh, yeah, and then and then and then the band had annoying. Like, Fuck. these guys. You see these guys like carrying out their shitty gear, and there's like this van in the center of the street. But then the whole all the traffic of Paris is waiting for them to load their gear in. So yeah. you can hear like so you can hear like oh, <laughs> Fucking miles, like fucking long haired bastards, you know, in French, of course, everything like hurry up with your shit. We don't care what you go. <laughs> and I go like, damn, I'm like glad I don't have to deal with this crap. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, but it's, it seems like in, in lots of parts of Germany and uh, Holland, and they a lot, a lot of the venues are actually in um, kind of like uh, nice places, like. I don't know if it, I don't know the, the uh, politics of it, but it almost seems like they're like um, kind of like government run or not maybe government run, no, but like not, some... anymore. Not, not anymore, not anymore. They used oh to, really? They used okay. to be back in um, well end of the eighties still and all that. They they got like you know like this kind of a cultural um, uh, yeah like cultural money for for uh, from the government you know to keep yeah so yeah. so they could they could do more than. Um, uh, that you could also like underground music, not just metal, but also, yeah, whatever, you know, like smaller bands from, for example, from the African continent or, you know, all that, you know, that kind yeah. of culture stuff. But th those days are over. I mean, everything is now, li um, yeah, liberalized. And uh, so they, yeah, it can happen that, um, that you play in some venue somewhere in the Netherlands and as, as a, you know, with a, let's just say with funerous, uh, and, and skeletal remains, you know, just mentioning something. And then the day after it, there's this, there's, there's this, uh, a Dutch rapper, you know, coming there because yeah. you know, they will the, the kids. So that's, but it's still, um, that's that's of course where they make their profit from. If you don't sell out as as a metal band, but still the conditions of it. I mean, they know how to treat a band. For them, it's simple. Like, okay, you know, a band's yeah. coming. There has to be so there has to be a decent meal. There have to be some drinks. Um, well, if they if they organize their own backline or, or they don't, but that's that's all in the, in the rider, you know, as we yeah. call it. So. Yeah, and you're cool, you know. It's it's um, yeah, it's it's always good. To, yeah, anyway, actually, yeah, I was always also surprised by South America that everything was well organized, you know. But okay, we took care of that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I've I've had worse. I mean, when when we did we did um the the, the West Coast, uh, we did six days there, mm -hmm. and then there was certain. I think it was in no no not was it Seattle or where the hell was it? Yeah, I think Seattle. Okay, it was cool. You know, it was a cool venue, but. We did realize that okay, this is where we. This is the states, you know. I mean, this yeah, is it's, it's still different. different. It's still different. It's it's yeah. um, you know, you get you, you know the thing like buyout. You don't have that over here. <laughs> yeah, it's really tough. It's really you tough know? to get a buyout to get like uh, good hospitality. It's it's actually really difficult because um, you know, European bands are so used to getting um, you know, kind of a, a better proper treatment from you know from their writer back you know, just like a proper backstage proper like you said a proper meal all stuff and they come to the u.s 
and they'll be like, you're struggling if you can get, you know, beer tickets and maybe some pizza or something. I actually remember when we were, um, we booked a tour with uh, enslaved here early on in their career. And, it, you know, it was culture shock for them, you know, because they just weren't <laughs> expecting, you know, because at that time, you know, Europe, you know, hospitality is just so good. I mean, when we go there, we're just like, this rules, you know, but, sure. you know, we'll, we're touring the U.S. Yeah, we, we know. And we were, we're from here, so we don't realize that we didn't realize the difference that much back then. So we brought enslaved. We told them, okay, it's going to be a little rough, you know, a little different or whatever. But they didn't realize, like, how different it was going to be, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'm sure it's the same thing for you guys, you know, especially when you came here first time, um, Well, you know. I, I kind of prepared the aspects, guys, for it. You know, I said, I don't expect anything. And then they go, yeah. well, as long as, uh, and then they, I mean, that, that's a cool thing, you know, they're really simple as well, you know, and easy. They go, like, well, you know, we are, Martin, as long as we have beers and something to eat, we're fine. You know, and that, yeah. and that, that's what we got. And it was, it was okay. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, I think if you, if, you, if you put it in, you know, proper perspective, you know, it's, it's okay. But it's just that bands expect, you know, roll out the red carpet and they just don't, you know, they don't have a, um, you know, a venue, many venues here that are going to give, you know, for an underground show that kind of hospitality it needs to be a really big uh, event. And then they'll treat, you know, they'll treat you a lot better, you know, yeah, for yeah. any kind of underground bands, it's very yeah. tough, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That uh, was funny. I mean, it's a quick, cool thing with LA. We sold that venue out. And, yeah. Uh, and um, I can't remember the name really of it, but uh, it was close to some park. I remember that. Uh, and that, the, the park was full of crack junks and all. Oh, is that? Oh, uh, uh, start with an O. I think I can't think of what it was called. Uh, I know. We, I, I think I know what you're talking about. No, it was cool. Either. We we sold. And actually, it was quite cool to be there. But then after the show, no, yeah, after the show is because we sold out. So they come came with this huge bucket uh, with like bottles in it in ice, and we go, "What's that?" And they go, "Yeah, it's champagne for you guys because you sold out." And I go, "What?" That's a nice guest. Yeah. <laughs> so I, but then again, again, the cool thing is, I, I took the bottle of champagne out and I looked at it and I go like, "Yeah, champagne, right? Welcome to America. This stuff is prosecco, man. That's, that's <laughs> like three, that's like these bottles are three bucks in Italy." <laughs> but, still, but still, you know, it was it was a nice one. It was a nice one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. It's that, that's the U.S. But it's okay, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and really, I mean, the scene, the scene on the West Coast in general is probably one of the better scenes in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, yeah, it's it's always. I mean, lately it's been really great because every time, uh, every tour we've been on that played in um, L.A. has been sold out or close to sold out. So it's really a great, just a great place for metal, you know. Yeah, but it's, it's, I mean, L.A. also has a big name huh, when it comes to metal. I mean, all the bands that come from there, you know, just, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, there's always the guys of uh, sadistic, you know, hanging around. And you've got all skeletons now, you know. So, yeah. yeah, it's always, I remember when I had a, yeah, I had a girlfriend back there. So I flew. Oh, out. that's right. That's right. You, yeah, you, yeah, you so. visit out there. So I forgot about that, you know. Yeah, yeah, it was cool. So I've been there like for, you know, a little bit and uh, I really enjoyed it. You know, I also went to L.A. to. There was some festival, uh, like gathering of the best. Gathering of the best allegiance, yeah. Yeah, which was really cool. It was really cool. Yeah, I really enjoyed it, and yeah, there's a. I mean, there's also a lot of smaller bands, you know, like um, damn, the guys of Ritual Torture. I met there, and they're really nice mm -hmm. guys, and you know, just but yeah, they're like really small, but still, it's good to hang out. And there is there is a scene, you know. I mean, I remember the new we did a, 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 a New Year's New Year's Eve party or something, and we just said we were in a house, you know, like thirty or forty metalheads. It was really cool. I really had a good time there. They know how to party, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's definitely killer. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I guess we probably should wrap it up. I mean, holy crap! I think we've been on this for over two hours now. <laughs> yeah, damn. But, but it's been it's been just a lot of fun chatting and BS and stuff. It's you know didn't even realize the time passed by so so long. But thank you so much. I totally appreciate it. Is there anything before you split that you want to uh, bring up or whatnot that maybe I missed or I don't know some kind of plug for something or anything? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, we were talking about, about so many things. <laughs> I mean, but it's really cool, John. You know, I mean, next time, uh, yeah, when all this, uh, well, maybe there's a there's a good 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 thing. This is a good thing to finish up with. I mean, let's let's just hope this whole, you know, pandemic thing will be bloody over really soon, and uh, 
you know, worldwide, I mean, and first of all, then, you know, you and me can meet again for like a decent beer and a talk <laughs> without, <laughs> without getting recorded. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. No, but yeah. I, I, hope, I, I, I sincerely hope like, uh, you know, that will be over really soon and not just, uh, it's not just only for the bands, you know, so they can perform again, but also the whole industry that, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's surrounding it, you know, like for example, now you do this for, you know, the record store, which yeah. is a really well, you know, really a noble guest here. And, and I mean, they suffer a lot too. And I really specifically also want the metalheads um, that are listening to this. <laughs> if like two hours, it's going to be a marathon, boys. <laughs> uh, no, but really, like, if, if you want to, if you want to have your vinyl or even your CDs or whatever, you know, or DVDs, try and try and not to order simply like through Amazon or whatever. Because first of all, they treat their personal like shit. And second, uh, if you, there will definitely be like a couple of you know smaller stores that try to do it online because like here in Europe everything is closed. Huh? There's, yes. It's impossible to go to a um, to a physical record store and go through your vinyl here at the moment. You can't. So they all um, try and yeah you know like offer something online or maybe you can just you know call them or email them or contact them with whatever just to you know to get your vinyl. Maybe you can even pick it up or something. So I definitely want to say to people try and support. Like um yeah the smaller stores because um they are the, really the ones that keep the you know keep the flame for metal alive and uh, yeah if you if you lose those if you lose the you know mom and pop if you lose all those it's just not going to be the same if you're forced to have to get it through the big you know these huge companies like Amazon they're not going to give two craps about you know what sells or what doesn't sell you know it just it's all for them it's just all numbers and stuff you know when you helping out somebody that opens up a store and someone that really does it because they love doing it. I mean, most record stores that are out now are not doing it because they're making huge amounts of money. They're doing it because they love music and it's, uh, you know, doing it for the right reasons. I think, you know, you're exactly right with uh, what you said. I absolutely totally appreciate so, yeah, it. So, so I really want to, want to, you know, people to think about that. And um, yeah, the same, not just for the, for the final stores, but also it goes for the bands. Try to support them as much as you can by, you know, whatever they do, if they got an album out, you know, and try and buy it. You can maybe also directly buy it off the bands or buy their merchandise or, you know, whatever. For example, yeah. um, we, we did this uh, release stream show. And uh, the reason why we did that was like, because Asterix does always like a traditional release show, you know, where we, it's the only time where we play, the only show where we play the whole entire, almost the whole entire new album. And then afterwards, you know, the shows we do is then, uh, you know, with the rest of the older material. And we decided to do this stream, which was a weird decision, but there was no other real option. And fortunately, people were so, you know, so so generous to, um, yeah, to donate some stuff, to, to, to buy merchandise. And, you know, mainly also because of that, I can live a couple of months longer. And, uh, yeah, we're also able to cover, you know, the cost that we did with the stream. So that's just one small example of that, it, that it really matters and that it really helps if you, um, if you support bands like that. So, uh, uh yeah, please do so, and also like uh, thank you very much for doing so. Mm. Yeah, and I I got my new uh, copy of the new Asphyx album. Um, ordered it online from um, you know uh, Rock Fantasy, so um, you know you could definitely get your copy there, or just from any any uh, local record store, and they totally appreciate it. And again, thank you very much for the interview. It's been a totally pleasure chatting with you. <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, it's just. Um, Great to catch up and just talk about some of the, uh, you know, kind of a trip down memory lane too. It's always fun to do that. And and um, I just want to let everybody know to, uh, you know, like the channel too, because we're going to do more killer interviews. I have uh, Jeff Bazaar from Possessed coming up. And um, big, big hello to Jeff. Yeah, kill, great, great guy. And absolutely, um, we're absolutely. doing a, a bunch of other, we're uh, doing uh, Suffocation with Hobbs and uh, a bu bunch of other cool, uh, you know, old school guys. So I love doing these old school chats. A lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. people seem to really dig it. They all happen to be like really friends of mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's kind of, I mean, all, all, all of us old school fucks, you know, or we're, we're all kind of friends in one way or another, just, you know, either from tape trading or just playing shows or something. And it's just, it's so much fun to be able to talk, do, you know, for me, it's great to do an interview on a musician to musician level. It just makes it so much more fun where it's not like, you know, hundred percent just based around, you know, a, a quick interview, just about the album, the new album. It's great to talk about that, but it's also just great to hear about these old stories. And I know the, the underground freaks really enjoy hearing about the, you know, 
the earlier times of metal and you know you just uh look at it from, we, i think i like to say i like to think that i look at it from a little bit different view you know than just um you know the normal interview it's more just like hang out talk kind of thing you know yeah it's like you know it's like like um I say that, uh, like walking to the bar, you catch like uh, you catch up with with you know guys like you and me, like talk, talking there and having a beer, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it could be this, you know. Yeah. And usually, usually at festivals that that won't happen because you always get disturbed by some people, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's always it's always difficult. Oh, it's 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 Mackenzie and uh, and Van Druden. Can we take a picture? Can we take? A picture? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hate it's, cell well, it's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's um, it, yeah, it's always cool to you know get at a regular show or just be able to hang out and just um, you know, have you know a uh, more intimate, normal kind of conversation, you know. Then yeah, at, at a venue, I mean, at a big festival, it's always difficult um, with all the uh, all the people there and stuff. But it's really cool. I appreciate you know, it's totally been a, a total blast. Give my best mm-hmm. to all the other guys in the band and congratulations on uh, another kick ass album. And, you know, I've seen how well it's doing and it's just, it's, you know, such a cool thing to see people from, you know, our, you know, old school scene just kicking ass um, still with new albums. I mean, in, in the last couple of years, a lot, I mean, the new Benediction album's been doing so great. You know, mm-hmm. your new album's been doing great. Just great to see that some of the classics from back in the day. Or people are showing so much interest in it. It's just the for me, it's just amazing because you know we're talking like what nineties is, uh, is what thirty years. <laughs> so it's it's amazing to think that uh, that people is, our music still relevant. But it really says a lot for what we did and stuff. So we all we all definitely should be proud of uh, you know what we did with our scene back you know in the day and what it means now. But anyway. Thank you again so much, and uh, take care, and we'll uh, we'll chat soon, okay? Yeah, thank you too, John. It was a pleasure, and uh, yeah, say hello to all the guys and uh, and everybody. Hey, thank you. Thanks, man. Take care. Bye-bye. Have a good one. Bye-bye.